The Holocaust is widely regarded as the greatest evil ever carried out by any government in history. Given the magnitude of this crime, it's disturbing that so many people, especially those under 40, know little or nothing about it. According to a recent study, young people have a worrying lack of basic Holocaust knowledge. So here are some facts that everyone should know. The Holocaust was a relatively recent event. It took place between 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, sparking World War II, and 1945, when Germany surrendered. During those years, the Nazi regime headed by Adolf Hitler set out to murder every Jew in the world, starting with every Jew in Europe. One of the things that made Nazi anti-Semitism different from other forms of ethnic hatred was that Hitler drew no distinctions among Jews. He regarded every Jew as an enemy worthy of death, Jewish children no less than Jewish adults. The SS, the Nazis' elite troops, would line up Jewish children next to parents and grandparents and have firing squads shoot them all. When the Nazis decided that murdering Jews by gunfire was too slow, they opened death camps in which they installed gas chambers. The Nazi SS would force hundreds of Jews into these chambers and pipe in poisonous gas. After about 15 minutes of hell, all the people inside would be dead, suffocated. The Nazis then forced other Jews to extract the bodies from the gas chambers and as a final indignity, examine the dead Jews' mouths to pull out gold teeth. They would examine hands as well. When rings were too tight, they would simply cut off fingers. They would also cut off the victim's hair, which German businesses used for mattress stuffing. Nothing was wasted. What explains the Nazis' murderous obsession with the Jews? After all, the Jews were a very small portion of Germany's population, as well as the world's population. In 1938, just prior to World War II, there were about 17 million Jews, less than 1% of the world's population of 2 billion. The Nazis murdered 6 million Jews, two-thirds of Europe's Jews, and one-third of all the Jews in the world. Why? The most commonly offered explanation is racism. The Nazis were racists and hated Jews and all other non-Aryans. Was Hitler a racist? Yes. Did he speak in derogatory terms of people other than Aryans? Yes. Is that why he murdered the Jews? No. It's easily proven that racism alone wasn't the primary reason for Nazi Jew hatred. Throughout World War II, the Nazis allied themselves with the non-Aryan Japanese. The Nazis also allied themselves with the non-Aryan Arabs, whose anti-Semitism made them natural allies of the Nazis. And while the Nazis certainly denigrated black people, they made no effort to persecute, let alone exterminate them. So, though Nazi anti-Semitism was racist, it wasn't solely or even primarily the product of racism. There was something much deeper behind this hatred. What infuriated Hitler and the Nazis about the Jews was their influence, moral, intellectual, and economic. If Aryans were the superior race, how could Jews be so influential? Hitler believed that the greatest battle on earth was between the Aryan and the Jew. Therefore, Aryans could prevail only if the Jews were destroyed. The Nazis blamed the Jews for creating everything they hated, communism and capitalism, Judaism and Christianity, which he regarded as a Jewish creation. Jesus was a Jew, the apostles were Jews, and two-thirds of the Christian Bible is the Jews' Bible. Hitler yearned for Germany to return to its pre-Christian pagan roots. Tragically, however, while Hitler hated Christianity, most of Germany's Christians didn't hate Hitler. Nazi Jew hatred was so all-consuming that killing Jews was ultimately more important to Hitler than winning the war. Even while the Nazis were losing the critical battle of Stalingrad, Trains that could have been used to aid German troops were diverted to transport Jews to the death camps. For Hitler and the Nazis, it wasn't enough to murder the Jews of Europe. They also had to be tortured and humiliated. Jews were beaten and starved to death, burned and frozen to death, made the subject of hideous medical experiments with no anesthesia, and nearly all the six million were stripped naked prior to being killed. A number like six million is an abstraction, it lacks flesh and blood. It's therefore impossible to fully grasp the horror of what the Nazis did. So, it might help to think of it as Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Judith Miller has. We must remind ourselves that the Holocaust was not six million. It was one plus one plus one. To this day, if you ask any student or professor on a college campus who was the most evil person to ever live, they'd almost certainly say Adolf Hitler. 
And what was Hitler's most evil act? The murder of six million Jews. The Holocaust. Of course, no one today would want to associate themselves with that evil. Would they? I'm Emily Austin for Prager University. All right. Okay. That is a beautiful thought. <laughs> camera speed, so anytime you want to go. Are we on camera? This is correct. Yeah, okay. Otto, are you ready? Otto? See, I'm letting you folks see the pre-broadcast preparation. Otto, are you ready? What is he doing? Is his tongue out? Yeah. Okay, good. Otto's ready. That is clear. That's really all that matters. The fire is going. Otto's ready. And, well, it's not. Uh, I'm ready, too. Hi, I'm Dennis Prager. This is my home. And it is a joy to be with you for the fireside chat, which is amazing. Given how much I travel, we never miss a week. Uh, right? Isn't that correct? I, I mean, I, in, in years. I mean, I'm very, I'm proud of that because it, it, it's, it sometimes takes place at an odd hour. By the way, the man behind the camera got married since we last were together, you and I. And we wish you only happiness. You. you have a terrific wife. You're a wonderful couple. May God bless your home. And uh, that was it. You went to Texas, correct? Yes. Yeah. And you're back and he's, he's, got, a, uh, he's got a wedding band on, as I have. I actually did a show years ago. You remind me. I'm going to do it again. I'm a big fan of wedding bands. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that marriage is important is that it makes a public statement. Uh, hello, society. I am committed to somebody. We live in such a narcissistic age that people don't think that way. I don't know what to society to get married. Nobody thinks that. It, it, it doesn't even occur to people let alone, again, with the wedding band. The wedding band is an announcement. I am committed to somebody. That doesn't mean that the, the person is an angel. doesn't mean that they'll never stray. I, 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 I'm, I know that the human being is flawed, but it's still, it's an announcement. And it's a good one to make for both the, the husband and the wife. So uh, it was nice to see, Rod. I'm really happy for you. I really am. And, and you're, you're a wonderful couple. And you have a, a wonderful neurotic dog, which is a good start for any marriage. True. Yes, it says in the good book, he who begins marriage with a neurotic dog has a happy life. Amen. It's the good book. I'm not referring to the Bible here. It's just a good book that I picked up one day with silly aphorisms. Anyway, great to be with you, everybody. And we're uh, living through... A, uh, an, an intense period in American life. And, and here's the amazing thing. There's no reason why it should be. For all intents and purposes, the United States is going through a golden age right now. We're, we're barely at war. I mean, I mean, obviously we have troops in Afghanistan who are risking and sometimes dying, risking their lives and sometimes dying. But basically we're at peace. The economy is, is, is remarkably robust, uniquely so, uh, essentially, in the world. Uh, 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 the University of Pennsylvania just published a study that there's less racial tension today than there was under Barack Obama. Because if you look in real life, there's virtually no racial tension. <laughs> in the life of the average American, is there tension when people of different ethnicities meet a white meets a Hispanic, Hispanic meets a black, a black meets an Asian? Nobody cares. <laughs> That's the amazing thing. The vast majority of, American don't, of Americans don't care. If it weren't for the left screaming and hysterical and angry and, and cursing, the, the, the country would have very little tension. But they manufacture hysteria because it gives their lives meaning. I was just looking at New York Times just today, I believe it was. It showed who is Republican, who is Democrat. And guess, shockingly, I'm, I'm being sarcastic. I knew I knew I would have said so. The group most likely to vote Democrat are young single women. Interesting, isn't it? So a young married woman is more likely to be a Republican. It's one of the reasons the left is not enthused about marriage. You lose people to the party. 
if they have a fulfilled personal life. In fact, if they have a fulfilled personal life in any way, because the whole point of the left since Marx through Lenin through today is get meaning through politics. Not through religion, not through family, not through work, not through joy of life. There is no joy of life on the left. The further left you go, you get to Bernie Sanders. Has Bernie Sanders laughed in 47 years? I don't know. It's one of the great puzzles. Anyway, a man who honeymoons in the Soviet Union is uh, got a screw loose. That's not where you go for your honeymoon to, to the most totalitarian state in the world at the time outside of North Korea and China. It's, it is. We're living in a spectacular time. But uh, every, everything... Uh, uh, if you, read, if you read the left, which means every normative uh, uh, newspaper except the Wall Street Journal and every mainstream medium in, uh, in, in television and so on outside of Fox News, uh, you, you would think the country's on the brink of a Nazi takeover. That's how sick they are. Not to mention cheapening the word Nazi, for which I don't forgive them. As a Jew, I have the utter, uttermost contempt for the left for cheapening the Holocaust by, by calling everybody, including me, <laughs> and of course the president, Nazis, Nazis. Either they don't know what the Nazis actually did, or they do know and don't care. I think it's the latter. They don't care. They don't care that they are calling good people by the worst possible adjective that we have in our language. It's worse than the word devil. Teams call themselves devils, right? The New Jersey Devils are a hockey team. Nobody says with the New Jersey Hitlers or Nazis. You can play with the word devil. You can't play with the word Nazi. But the left plays with the word Nazi. This week, uh, the, uh, we came out. Uh, our weekly PragerU video is called The Charlottesville Lie given by Steve Cortez of CNN, and I just have to say, Steve, Steve Cortez has the most important trait that society must cultivate in human beings for goodness to prevail, and that's courage. Goodness without courage is useless. It's just the way it is. Most good people are not courageous. And that's a very sad fact of life. He is. For him to, to make a video and stand up, uh, outside of the video as well and say, guess what? The media lied and have continued to lie and lie at this moment. I just saw the cover of Newsweek magazine and uh, it shows the president and what does it say? They were fine people. They are very fine people. We're going to show it on, on, on the screen. This lie, the Charlottesville lie, as we call it in the video and he calls it, is that the president called Nazis fine people. It, it, it's so obvious a lie. On, on, first of all, he, he said the, the, the very next day at his press conference or the next two days, whatever it was, the day after or the two days after. He said, of course I condemn them. It, 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 it's, they're, they're, all, they're evil. Um, I, was not, I was referring to the people who came to uh, protest the, the Confederate statues and the people who came to defend keeping up Confederate statues. And I said, there are good people, very fine people on both sides. And he was right, there are. There are fine people who think you take down the statues of people who did the wrong thing in history. And there are people who say, you don't, you don't take them down uh, because you don't erase history. <coughs> okay, so there are good arguments on both sides. But... Uh, he wasn't referring to Nazis. There's such an obvious proof. This man, who's, who's accused of saying there are fine people who were Nazis, or there are Nazis who were fine people, has a Jewish daughter, Jewish son-in-law, and Jewish grandchildren. Now, guess what Nazis want to do to Jews? Murder them. That's the essence of Nazism, is to murder Jews. That is, that is the core belief of Nazism, is to slaughter Jews. Hitler was more interested in killing Jews than he was in winning World War II. Read The War Against the Jews by Lucy Davidowitz. I mean, this is, this is a very, very well-known uh, fact of history. That is what animated Hitler. 
annihilating Jews, wiping them out. A Jewish baby was, was a, a, a state enemy. Now, do, do, you can think what you want about the president, but it takes uh, a, a type of human who m is beyond anyone's imagination who would think they're refined people who want to murder their children and grandchildren. Is that fair? Even a leftist would have to acknowledge that. So it's impossible he believes that there are fine Nazis. It's impossible. Also, there's another obvious argument. There are fine people on both sides, so if he meant Nazis, then he also meant Antifa. You think he, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, thinks there are good people in Antifa? There are very fine people in Antifa? I don't. If you're in Antifa, you're despicable. You're the scum of the earth. Just as if you're a Nazi, you're the scum of the earth. That's moral clarity. Hello? The opposite of what you get if you go to school. He thinks there are good and fine people in Antifa? That's what you're saying if, you, if he says both sides, right? It's impossible. There's this moronic video up, and I only make reference to it because it's got 106,000 views, which is, just makes me cry. I don't care if the people attack me. It is, it is, I've discussed this on, this on these broadcasts. It means nothing to me, nothing. Uh, but I do care if people lie and, 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 and sucker in people to it. His argument, the guy, by the way, he's anonymous. You don't see his face. You don't have his name. All you see is a skull and crossbones. This is a sophisticated presentation for highly sophisticated people watching. I have an image of this guy sitting in his mother's basement. And, and his argument is, oh, Prager, you was lying. Prager, you lies. Prager, you lies. They, they, uh, uh, they said that the media said that the president said that, the pres that there are uh, fine people on both sides and so that the, you know, the, they were fine Nazis. And they said, it's not true. The media never said that. And I, and I thought, this guy has to be kidding. The cover of Newsweek just now is the claim again that the president said there are fine people among the, 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 the uh, uh, white supremacists and Nazis. That's the entire message of the media for, for the last, uh, what is it, 17? Yeah, two years. That's like saying the media, what, the media have, uh, the media have said there was Russian collusion? Oh, Prager, you was lying. The media never said there's Russian collusion. <laughs> <laughs> the people who believe that video, do you realize this? There's a perfect phrase for these people. The Groucho Marx did it when he was caught uh, uh, having an affair with another woman uh, in the bedroom. And his famous line, you're going to believe me or your lying eyes. That, the people watching, the people who think that this is a, a valid video have just lived through an immersion of the society in the lie that the president said that there were good Nazis. And this guy, this anonymous crackpot, <laughs> makes a video and people go, yeah, wow, they didn't say that. That's, uh, I, I wonder how many of the viewers went to college. My suspicion is a lot because college teaches you not to think clearly. But uh, there's no excuse for, for any uh, decent human being to believe uh, such stuff. Anyway, that's, uh, that's where we're at. The hysteria of the left denying the reality of today in America. It's, a, it's an unbelievably wonderful place to be. This, this racist, uh, uh, this racist uh, president has uh, has done more for blacks than the previous president who was black. That's not an opinion, that's a fact. But it doesn't matter. Doing good doesn't matter to the left. Doing left matters to the left. Okie doke, take your questions, comments, alternate speeches. Isabel, 22, Evergreen, Colorado. Is this the Isabel I know? Uh, she's precious. 
Have you seen the most recent cover of Newsweek? Just talked about it. The term white supremacist is thrown around constantly and has lost all meaning. What are your thoughts on that? Can you define white supremacy? Well, I told you my thought. Okay, so uh, the number of Americans who believe whites are inherently superior. Uh, and let and by the way, this is a very important aspect. And do something about it. See, if you walk around thinking, let's say you walk around thinking that you are the finest human being on earth and all the, only your family members are all superior to all other human beings. I don't really care. If you act on it, in other words, you think that anyone outside of your family can be persecuted or even killed, then I care. But otherwise, what people think, that's a leftist preoccupation. That's why all leftism is totalitarian if they have the power to do it. It's definitional. Liberals are not totalitarian. Conservatives are not totalitarian. Leftists are. Because they, they want to retrain your thinking. That's the, you can think evil. Religious people believe only God uh, judges our uh, thoughts. The left believes the government or they can judge your thoughts. Let's say you do believe, which I think is idiotic, just idiotic. Whites are superior. If you don't act on it, what do I care? I'm a Jew. Let's say you can't stand Jews. If you don't act on it, I don't care. I care how you act. That's the only thing I care about all other 7 billion people on earth is how they act. The left cares how you think. That's scary. I don't care how you think. You think whites are superior, you're out of your mind. But I don't care if you're out of your mind. If you don't act on it, it doesn't matter to me. You don't think there are blacks who think they're superior to whites? You don't think there are Asians who think they're superior to everybody else? They do the best. They have the highest grades. They have the, the, the best per capita income. <laughs> so what? China, do you know, you know what China means in Chinese? Middle kingdom. They think they're the middle of the world. They've always believed this. Non-Chinese are barbarians. The Chinese are higher. Do you care? I don't care. If they don't act on it, what do I care? Japanese think they get the sun before everybody else on earth. Did you know that? It's called the land of the rising sun. That's why there's a sun on the Japanese flag. It's not a target. It's a sun. Do you think the Japanese get the sun before everybody else on earth? Bet you you don't. Do you care that the Japanese do? Bet you you don't. Neither do I. When they acted on it in World War II, that was bad news. When they repressed and tortured and, and, and did medical experiments on Chinese and Koreans, that's, by the way, those are the people who suffered the most under the Japanese rule, not Americans. People who suffered the most were Asians. But the odds are, if you went to college, you have no idea about what I'm talking about. Carbon emissions, on the other hand, or that you call some students Z rather than he or she, that you know, for uh, $100,000 in debt. Lucky you. Can you define white supremacy? Yeah, you believe whites are inherently superior. Uh, as I said, it's, it's about as stupid a belief as one could have. What does that even mean? You actually believe that? It, even, even, I'd like to me, I mean, there are a handful of people who believe it. As, as, as Alan Dershowitz, the, the professor at Harvard Law, said to me in, in our movie, uh, not, not his and mine, Adam Carroll and my movie coming out in September, uh, he, uh, he said to me in his apartment, and you'll see it, as a Jew, as an American, as a liberal, as a Democrat, I am much more afraid of the left than the right. He said, these Nazis, they're, they're the past. They're irrelevant. But the left is frightening. And, and that's true. I mean, the Nazis are, are the worst. I agree. But they're, they're irrelevant. They're only relevant because the left wants them to be relevant so that they have relevance. Look at me. I'm fighting Nazis. Yeah, during World War II, that was a very big deal. You were a hero to fight Nazis during World War II. Fight Nazis in the United States today, you're not exactly a hero. Okay, it's just context matters, doesn't it? Jakub Vesely, 17 years old, Czech Republic. How important is the American pioneering spirit which the U.S. adopted alongside its Western values? Your English is very good. Just want to tell you, though, 
most Americans don't know this, so don't feel bad. It's, in this case, is I-T-S, not I-T apostrophe S. Uh, it's just, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, now, by the, is that from him, or did somebody at PragerU uh, screw up? Probably copy and paste it. So. Copy and paste, that's what I thought. It, I-T apostrophe S means it is. Uh, the odds are that all, most of you American young people watching do not know that, but, but again, I'm sure you were told about global warming in high school. That I-T-S, it, it means, with an apostrophe, means it is. I don't expect that to, uh, to have been taught. So anyway, uh, the American pioneering spirit is a very big deal in the United States. That is correct. We, uh, and you know why? In part, in part because America's so big and there was always more space to conquer. There's another reason, though. It's part of our ethos because life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You pursue happiness, you're, it's a pioneering spirit. That's why it's, it's so funny to talk to Western Europeans. They still laugh at us. Oh, all of you have air conditioning. And, and then when it gets hot in Europe like it's been this, this summer... They go, eh, maybe air conditioning is not such a bad idea. Uh, don't, you want to have a great conversation on your next trip to uh, uh, Europe? Ask them what they think of dryers. <laughs> they have total contempt for dryers. Just hang, hang it outside, which in Europe is ingenious because it's raining half the time. Why would you want to hang your, your laundry outside for the rain to get wet again? And it's not clean rain in many instances. Yeah, we, so that's a part of it. We're the pursuit of happiness. We're very, we're, uh, we, we are a pioneering entrepreneurial people. Hope I meet you in the Czech Republic one day, Jakub. Ryan, 14, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I like this, all these young people. This is a big deal. By the way, if you're 89 and want to send a question, I, I don't discriminate. I just take what I get. I will take your question if it's a good question. Just want you to know that. Why does nothing the left do or push forward give people a sense of purpose or happiness? No, I think you're misstating the case. Everything the left does gives them a sense of purpose. That's, they don't have one, so leftism fills the void. They don't have religion. Very many don't believe in marriage. They they are devoid. They don't have... God and country gave most Americans meaning. God and country. And then, of course, family. God, family, country, right? But if you don't have God, you don't have country, and you don't have a, a, a family that you've made, you, obviously people have parents, so you're going to have to find meaning in some left-wing cause. And, 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 and on the race issue, they're trying to redo the 60s. Let's do it again, because, oh, those lucky people, they really, and they really did. In the 60s, there was, real, there was something to really fight. The idea that a black could not stay at a certain hotel or eat at a lunch counter, I mean, it's sickening. I get it. But today? So they have to fight for, for new stuff. Oh, I will get meaning out of telling a three-year-old who says, you know, I really am a girl. Oh, you really are a girl. Poor guy who I uh, was on Candace Owens' uh, show on, on PragerU. And what was his name again? Mario Lopez. Mario Lopez. He, he just commented, if, you're th if your three-year-old says, the three-year-old boy says, I'm a girl, you, you don't immediately say, yes, you're a girl. It's not doing him a favor. And he was buried and he, in that he, he recanted because they, they bullied him and his job was threatened and everything. Anyway, they don't have much happiness, though. There isn't, there isn't happiness to be found on the left. A happy leftist is an oxymoron. There were happy liberals, there were happy conservatives, there were no happy leftists. What's, the, uh, what's our time frame? 24. Cool. Casey, 15, Los Angeles. Hi, Casey, how you doing? Mm, I don't know what your answer is. I hope you're doing well. Hi, Mr. Prager. Hi, Casey. You seem to have an opinion on a wide variety of topics and issues. Ha! You bet. That's why, by the way, I, I have a very, I know I have a strange mind. I know this, in that uh, ideas uh, just constantly pop up in my mind, constantly. That's why I'm totally okay with silence. Because uh, I'm having a, an interesting time with my brain. 
<laughs> it's come comes up, comes up with another idea, and uh, it's 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 it, it's a gift. I don't take credit for it. It's but it's true. I do. I've and I care about just about everything, which is partly what makes listening to you so interesting. Good point. I am curious if there is anything you have no opinion on. What a great point. Or uh, are undecided or are apathetic towards. Thanks. Well. I, I look at the questions about two minutes before I come on with you. There's not exactly a long time to, uh, to prepare answers. But I was thinking, my wife is here, so sh uh, she immediately uh, knew, uh, what do I have no interest, uh, no opinion on? Women's shoes. I, I, real, I don't even, it, it is, I, it's actually, it's more than that. They so don't interest me that I don't even know if a woman is wearing them or not. Uh, I know it, this is maybe sound pathetic. I, I'm fully uh, prepared for that uh, possibility. I am not sure that uh, if I were in a crowd at an airport, I would know which women are barefoot and which women had shoes on. <laughs> now, I can't say I'm particularly interested in men's shoes either, to be perfectly honest. Uh, it, my view is if they fit me, I just put them on because uh, at six foot four, you, you get a large foot with that body. So I'm just happy if I can find a, a 14, a size 14 shoe. But uh, anyway, so that would be an example. Uh, I, I must admit I have no, and this is a flaw, I admit it. I have no interest in gardening. And I know a lot of people do, and I envy them. I, you, you, you're, you're a better person than I am. I, I acknowledge it. But uh, if you left me alone in the gardening tools department in, in a store, I would start uh, thinking about uh, my, uh, you know, my favorite Shakespeare works, or, or, or you know, or what symphony uh, I, I, I would like to conduct next. I, I, it just it doesn't excite me. But most things do excite me. Uh, I will admit it, uh, but uh, I, I, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, uh, the, here is my, um, here's one I really admit. This is going to lower me in some of your esteem. Uh, so I'll put it in, in, the, in the words of a friend of mine, Bruce Hershenson. Bruce Hershenson ran for U.S. Senate many years ago against Barbara Boxer in California, and he nearly won, and we, we've been very close for many, many years. And he once said to me, Dennis... I am going to tell you Bruce Hershenson's nightmare. I was thinking, what is, what is Bruce Hershenson's nightmare? Is packing a car with stuff for the beach. And I thought, yeah, that's my nightmare too. The thought of sitting in the sun on the beach has no appeal to me. My view is that uh, oceans are for fish and cruise ships. That is why God made swimming pools. That's where we should be for swimming. Many don't feel as I do, and I respect that completely, but I admit that the beach holds no appeal to me. I love mountains, and I live by mountains, and I love them. But the beach... So, yeah, so there are a fair number of topics that would qualify for that great question. Who, who was sent that again? Casey in L.A. What's our time now? 28. All right. Uh, fine, on second. How do I get rid of the keyboard? Oh, there it is. <laughs> it shows a keyboard with a down arrow. I should have found that sooner. Jim, 14, Nashville, Tennessee. I was just in Nashville. My dear friend Carol Swain running for mayor. How should I tell a leftist friend as to why Trump has been a good president in our time? Thank you for all your hard work with PragerU and the Fireside Chats. I love listening. Thank you for starting them. That's very sweet of you, Jim. Well, what... Aside from the rhetoric, things that the president says that your leftist friend will object to, putting that aside, ask your friend, what do you think he's done that has hurt America? 
in light of the lowest unemployment rate in recorded history for blacks and Hispanics and a low one, a low unemployment rate for everybody. So you can't point to economics. What what would you what would your friend point to? Is your friend did your friend think that having a deal with the with the with the most evil regime in the world, the Iranian regime, was a good idea? Smuggling to them vast sums of money to to bribe them into an agreement that only God knows if they would have kept in any event. They are the, the they are the mother of terrorism on earth. The Iranian regime. This president is taking a very hard uh, uh, stance against them. The, another one of the great lies is he's Putin's man. If he were Putin's man, he wouldn't be so anti-Iran. Iran is Putin's man. He's done nothing to benefit uh, Russia. Nothing. Another grandiose lie. He's Putin's man. Because if the whole media says something enough, that's all you need. It doesn't need to be true. It needs to be repeated. What this man has done... Uh, I had uh, my wife and I had had a dinner with Vice President President uh, Pence and his wife, and uh, uh, I'm only mentioning this. I don't. Dro- I'm not a name dropper. It's of no interest to me, but it's relevant. And he said the whole world, in effect, warned the president not to move the Israeli embassy to its capital, Jerusalem. The the world would erupt in flames. The whole Middle East would go up in flames. The president did what was right. Virtually every president had promised to move the American embassy when they ran for office and then reneged when he got into office. This president promised it and actually did it. Nothing happened. Nothing. All it did was strengthen America in the eyes of people in the Middle East. Whoa. This is no namby-pamby America elected. They elected a serious guy. The only country in the world we didn't have an embassy in its capital is Israel. It's not a spit in the face to one of the closest allies we have on earth. That's the way the president thought. And I could name so many terrific things at this guy. He's taking on China. China is a, is a, has a communist totalitarian, well, almost totalitarian, certainly tyrannical regime. He's taking them on. And I'll tell you, I think this will forestall an armed war at a later point, taking them on economically now. This man has courage. Courage is the rarest of the good traits. That's how I opened up tonight's session, or today's session, depending when you're looking at it, with Steve Cortez, who has courage. So thanks for the questions. Thanks for watching. Our past... My past fireside chats are as relevant as this one, and I, I, I aim for that to be, so you, you could watch past ones and have, uh, have your mind hopefully opened and challenged. It is a joy to do this with you. Thank you for being with me. And until next week, from the newest married member of our crew to all of you, thanks. Bye. What's up, guys? This is Will Wee with PragerU, and in honor of Holocaust Remembrance Day, we're asking people what they know about Auschwitz and what they know about the Holocaust. Take a look. What is the Holocaust? The what? The Holocaust. I don't know. What is the Holocaust? The who? The Holocaust. This is some California stuff. What group of people did the Nazis target? Oh, why is it about Nazis? Um, kids. What is Auschwitz? Auschwitz, the, the country. I don't know. Is it the little red mint in a, <laughs> in a container? Something to do with the war. Back in the days, in the hologram thing. What is Auschwitz? Things in the in space. <laughs> Close. No. No. <laughs> I'll tell you at the end. Okay. Do you know how many Jews were killed during the Holocaust? Um, 8,000? 6 million. <gasps> really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. What is the Holocaust? Uh, the Holocaust is the execution or the removal of all Jews from Germany. They wanted to eradicate the Jews. Alabama schools aren't as bad as they say. <laughs> Are you a supporter of Israel? Yeah. 
Yeah. I guess, yeah. I guess, yeah. yeah. I'm enough. a believer, so. Do you support Israel? Um, yeah, Israel's cool. They got a nice little Judaic star. <laughs> Do you think it's important that you should know about history and these things? I should. But at this point, Trump is in office. It don't matter what you know. We all gonna die. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, guys. The fact that even one person doesn't know what the Holocaust is is appalling to me. We need to educate our future generations, so thank you for watching this. Please follow me and PragerU on social media. Share this video with your friends and let us know what you think. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fireside Chat number 267. Here's Otto, and Snoopy is beneath me, and in the beginning, right before the broadcast, was a third dog, believe it or not, who we are taking care of for an indefinite period of time. I have no idea how this happened. My wife has told me three times how we ended up with this dog, and I still don't quite uh, understand it. In any event, we have, and you can see what was videoed right before I began talking now. So we, it's, it's a busy house here at the Prager House. Great to be with you. I, I would like to tell you that everything we do is made possible thanks to people donating to PragerU. Everything is free, and everything is a lot of things now. So I'd like you to know that until Christmas... Everything you donate will be tripled. Some donors have made it a beautiful form of donation that they will triple whatever you give to us. So please go to PragerU.com. Anyway, it's the time of year when people do feel generous, and they should. And we have Hanukkah, and we have Christmas, and New Year's. It's a time to think about it. I, I actually should talk about giving charity once, you know. It, 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 it makes you feel good. It's one of the, it, it's, I have an analogy to working out. Uh, if you're at least like me, and I think I'm normal, you don't look forward to working out, believe it or not. I do three times a week with a trainer and I don't look forward to it, but I'm very much happier after I did it. Charity is very similar. Very few people wake up in the morning and go, oh, another day to give money away. But then the second, I mean, the second you do it, there, there is a wonderful feeling that uh, you experience. So anyway, PragerU.com, whatever you give is tripled until uh, December 25th. Well, I have a very intense subject and uh, it was brought to my attention by Megan One, the original Megan. Megan the original, <laughs> who is here. And on one of the PragerU Instagram pages, that of Marissa Stride, our CEO, there was a picture of a previous article I had written, I don't know, was it within the last two weeks? because I write a column every week. There are a thousand of my columns all on the internet, by the way. And I got to tell you, they're all worth reading because very few are dated. And I try to say something important in, in each column. Here's one, for example, this week. Will secular conservatives have conservative grandchildren? I ought to talk about that one of these days. My, my belief is that most will not. Because without God and without religion, America will not survive. And without God and without religion, conservatism will not survive. Certainly the founders would have agreed with me. But anyway, I wrote a piece and the title was very provocative. And I acknowledge that it was very provocative. If Holocaust deniers do not go to hell, there is no God. And this uh, bothered a lot of people who made a whole host of objections to the title. I don't think almost any of them actually read the article, which is a shame. And it might have taught me a lesson. Don't make the title so provocative <laughs> that people think they don't need to read the article. I just should have written about how evil Holocaust deniers are. 
And if I wanted to put a hell reference uh, uh, in the in the content, then I would have. But I do want to respond to some of the uh, annoyed and some angry responses uh, to what I wrote. In no order of importance, uh, a common one was, who is Dennis Prager to say who goes to hell? So that's a very interesting question. Since I don't determine who goes to hell, what difference does it make? Right? <laughs> I mean, I don't believe I determine who goes to hell, but I do believe that there is a God who judges humans and there is a level of evil that unless you repent, and I certainly oh, always uh, have the, the opening and, and hopefulness that people will repent, I wanted to make the point that this is in the category of a truly evil thing. So l let me just put that aside, therefore. Let let's get rid of that very quickly. It's, a, it's an odd question, who, who am I to say who goes to hell? You can differ with me. You can say, no, it is not evil enough to qualify. Or as many did, the only people who go to hell are people who don't believe in Jesus Christ. You can say that. That is your view. But of course, you are then doing the same thing that you're attacking. You're saying who goes to hell, people who don't believe in Christ. But then you'll say, ah, but that I, I didn't, I'm not saying that. That's what I believe God says. Fine. So I believe that God says that evil people go to hell I I independent of their theology. Okay. So, so we're all in the same boat. We're, we're all in a set, essentially, uh, at least those of us who believe that there is a hell, and I do believe that, uh, whether you use the term hell or not, one of the 13 principles of the Jewish faith, which is my faith, according to the greatest Jewish thinker who ever lived, Maimonides in the 12th century, uh, one, of the, one of the 13 principles is that there is reward and punishment after death. So whether punishment is called hell or just punishment, what's the difference? Clearly, it is a, it is a s substantive belief of Judaism that there is reward and punishment uh, given out, meted out by God after this life. Judaism believes that it is done on the basis of behavior rather than specifically faith. But what, whatever your belief, we all believe, uh, all Jews, all Christians do believe that they're not all Jews are all Christians. I, I, I don't want to fall into that trap. Uh, all all those who believe in traditional Christianity or traditional Judaism believe that there is a punishment afterwards. Who gets there is not my, my debate. But you, you can't say, who am I to say that such people will go there? If I would say, torturers of children go to hell, would you attack me? I mean, I, I, it would be an odd thing. Y you wouldn't look that good to your friends. Oh, this guy Prager says that those who torture children go to hell. What the hell does he know? Some of them even said it was blasphemy. Is that blasphemy? It's a strange use of the term, in my opinion, of to say it was blasphemous. But look, people were annoyed that I said that. And that's fine. That's okay. Uh, I'm a big boy. I can handle it. I, I just want to make clear that the objection that someone says some people go to hell, who the hell is he <laughs> to say anybody goes to hell is a bizarre, is a bizarre argument. I hope that everybody believes that certain people get punished after this life. It's a very odd notion of a just God that nobody gets punished. Would you agree to that? Okay. So next, next one. Uh, let's see what else was there. So obviously there there was the, the 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 one written by a number of Christians that the only people who go to hell are people who who don't believe in Christ but that's I don't even believe that that's a Christian belief because there is a level of evil that most Christians uh, believe that even if you say you believe in Christ but if you engage in such evil then clearly your belief is is not authentic and you would you would go to hell uh, it, 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 it does not bring Christians and Christianity and Christ uh, uh, glory 
for a Christian to say, it doesn't matter how you behave. Uh, it, it, and it's not Christian. Uh, I know Christianity pretty well, and I, I am immersed in, in the world of Christians. To say some of the dearest humans in my life are, are, are Catholic and, and Protestant, evangelicals, is to understate the case. And uh, none of them would say, it, God doesn't care how you behave. What yep. if they say your good or bad ideas? Like okay, yes, that's a, thank you for reminding me. That's correct. So some so some objectors did I did I so did I did I handle the last part uh, sufficiently? Fine. So uh, what, what is the famous line again from the New Testament? It is what is it uh, by by uh, works through by no 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 works without faith. Uh, f- faith without works is dead. Okay, that that's that too is a, in in the New Testament. That that's a that's a pretty ba- big deal. So, uh, but as also it is by your by the fruit the tree shall be known, or something to that effect. In other words, it, it, your actions tell us how authentic your faith is, which is of course true. Oh, I believe in Christ, and and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna molest a child. Uh, it, it's it's it. It, it, it's inconceivable. Of course, everybody sins. And as I point out in the very beginning of my piece, there are gradations of sin. Anyone who says that God regards stealing a towel from a hotel and torturing children as equal because they're both sins, well, I don't think that that brings uh, uh, glory to God. All right, let, let, let's put it that way. Then there was the other one that you raised. What was that again? Oh, yeah, thoughts. Yeah, ideas. Holocaust deniers, I don't care what they think. If you, if you go public and try to influence people, that's different. That's an action. Spe- public speech is an action. Private speech is not necessarily. That's why I never judged Donald Trump on the basis of a comment he made, not knowing he was recorded speaking to another guy. Uh, I thought it was very foolish to say I judge him. If everyone were judged by things they said privately, everybody would be judged awfully. There has to be a place where you could just say whatever you want to a friend and 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 not not be judged by it by others. And if it's recorded, then the, the recording uh, was, that was the bad in that scenario, much more than the speech. However, public speech, that's different. Public speech affects others, and that's a very, very big deal. There is a, ver- a famous Hebrew saying that I learned, and every kid who goes to a yeshiva, a religious Jewish school, uh, learns this in Hebrew, but I'll say, of course, in English. Whoever, uh, well, it's tough to say it in English uh, because the Hebrew works better because it's a play on words, but it doesn't matter. Who, whoever publicly humiliates his neighbor, it is as if he has murdered him. So, in other words, if I say a humiliating thing to my friend about somebody in, in, in the privacy uh, of my room or to my wife, in what we call, uh, what is it, the bedtime talk or whatever the word is, that's not the same as if I publish it on the internet or in my case, say it on the radio. That humiliating humiliation necessitates public by definition. You can't be humiliated and nobody know about it. So uh, I'm not talking, I, I, I didn't talk about private thoughts. I, and I don't believe you go to hell for your thoughts. In fact, I don't, I don't care that much what you think. I care how, what you say publicly and how you act. Those are the two criteria that I use. Public speech and actions, whether they're private or public. You murder somebody privately, it's, it's evil. I mean, all right. Yeah. Look, I've devoted my life to trying to bring moral clarity to people. So these are the reflections of a lifetime of thought on, on really, really important uh, subjects. So my issue is not that there are people who don't believe that there's a Holocaust and say it to a friend, but the man 
who was brought to meet the president, ex-president of the United States, and, and publicly mocks the Holocaust by comparing the, the, uh, the, the murdered Jews to baked cookies and says only a few hundred thousand were killed. This is, this is a, a, a person of surpassing cruelty. See, if you know what happened in the Holocaust, then you understand why I believe it is so evil. Do you know how many, how many Jews were, for, were, were burned alive? The gas is the most famous, but how many families were shot to death? And if you didn't die on the bullet, you were buried alive. I mean, the amount of horrific, unspeakable suffering and seeing it happen to, your, to family members and friends, the people experimented on, People who had their eardrums burst because they were placed in high pressure chambers to see what happens. You go out of your mind from such excruciating pain. So people deny that happened and I'm supposed to say, gee, that's sad. What am I supposed to say? What are you supposed to say? It is the most documented single event that I know of in history. By the way, I would say this if somebody denied that 5 million Ukrainians were starved by Stalin or 60 million Chinese were murdered uh, by, uh, by Mao or 20 to 40 million uh, Russians were, or, or Soviet citizens were killed in the Gulag by, by Stalin. I would say the same thing, but it's interesting. Nobody denies these. Nobody denies that Pol Pot murdered a, a quarter of the Cambodian people. Yet another communist genocide in Cambodia. Nobody denies those. And they're much less documented. Gulag is much less documented than the Holocaust. And yet if you denied that, I would say you're evil. That's correct. But nobody denies the other ones. The only genocide denied is the Jews because the people who'd say it hate Jews. And I don't care personally if you personally like or hate Jews. I care if you act on it. And, and denying the Holocaust is an act of, of surpassing cruelty. So that's, I wanted to respond because there were so many responses, both on YouTube and on Instagram and uh, to my columns, it, 600 responses just in American greatness alone. So I thought it would be a, 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 an important thing to respond to. So here's an irony for the, the Christian writers about uh, who are annoyed with me. I'm going to say something that is, will shock you, but it's either true or not. I don't know of a Christian, living Christian, certainly historically there have been, but I don't know of a living Christian at this moment who has brought more people to church, to Christian faith than I have, than this Jew has. Just for the record, just look at, at, the, at the comments, the thousands of comments on my Bible commentary. Oh, you know what? Now, now I'm going to go back to church. Uh, I, he has made the case for God and religion. And by the way, I brought, I think, proportionately an equivalent number of Jews back, back to synagogue, as it were. Uh, but uh, just wanted to let you know that I am proud of that fact. If people rediscover their Christian roots, uh, this Jew is happy that that has happened. Okay, let's go to our questions. Thank you, Megan's arm. My first back. The, the re-debut of your arm. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Prager, my name is Annalisa. I'm a member of Prager Force in Southern California. I'm currently in Savannah, Georgia, doing a master's degree at Ralston College, which I must give you a quick thank you for. You were one of the reasons I decided to pursue this degree. And I've had an amazing experience, met our chancellor, did a podcast with his wonderful wife. So thank you. My question to you is, since you've had experience publishing books, what do you value in an editor? And what publishing houses would you recommend I look into for a career? Thank you again. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Now let's go. I did it. <laughs> the halfway was the giveaway. Mm. What do I value in an editor? 
Wow. I could spend the rest of the broadcast on this. I am stunned that writers do not always seek editors. I write well and I edit others. But I want as I not only want editors, I I want edit I don't I don't only want an editor, I want editors. The more the merrier. I want to put out the best possible work I can. One of the reasons that my my works are good and widely read and influential is the number of editors that I seek. I want editors for content. Did you get this fact right? Or here is another fact that you might want to use for a style. You could have said this more elegantly or my favorite more concisely. I'll talk about that in a moment. I want editors just for typos. It is you can't catch your own, all of your own typos. It's not possible because you read knowing what you meant to write. So, so uh, typos, facts, and style. I don't know what else an editor does. Th those are three. So if you want to be an editor, I assume that's why you're asking the question. Or maybe you want to be a writer and you want to know what type of editor to seek. You need either one person can do all three things, which is rare, but possible, or you need different editors to pursue different aspects of it. I will, I will tell you a secret of mine and, and why I know that people, I know from the feedback I get, people read, if they start reading my, a book of mine, they generally read the whole book. I write extremely tersely, extremely concisely. If, if, if the sentence has 10 words and I can make it into seven words, I get a little thrill. I love when people get rid of words of my own and when I find a way to say it in fewer words. The fewer the words, the more the readers. I don't mean the fewer the words in total. If you write a, a 500 page book and write tersely, that's still few words. I don't mean quantity of the book. I mean per sentence, per paragraph. I call it fat. Get rid of fat in every sentence and in every paragraph. One of the ways I do is I get rid of adjectives. I want the reader to supply the adjectives. Uh, uh, I supply the facts or the, or the arguments. Then the reader will, in fact, supply uh, the, the adjectives. By the way, when I talk, I try to talk as concisely as well, which is why people tend to watch my videos like this. I, I, I don't add unnecessary points. It's harder in speaking because you can't go back and erase speech. But I'm conscious when I'm speaking, say your point and move on, which is exactly what I'll do now. As for publishing houses, it, it almost doesn't matter. Just it's all I would say is when possible, unless you are very well known and will have a very large readership no matter who publishes your work. It's very much better to get a publishing house than to publish your own work. Okay, here we go. Luke, 11 years old, Asheville, Asheville, North Carolina. How do you deal with your finances? So Luke, let me say that if you're asking that question at 11, you are one fortunate young dude because kids are not taught about money ever. They're taught a lot of things that are not useful and they're taught very little that is useful. That's one of them. I wish I had been taught at an early age the value of saving money, for example. And if you start minimally at your age, everyone who starts early can end up a millionaire. That's right. No, no matter how much you, you make, you don't have to be in a very high paying job to end up a millionaire if you start saving at, a, at an early age. I didn't. 
I'm very lucky that I've been able to make money at a, at a later age, but uh, most people cannot. So you should start early. So the fact that you asked the question is terrific. I will say this, though, to be very personal. I have always been more interested in touching people's lives than in making money. The one proof is that I've been devoting, I will have devoted about 10 years to my Bible commentary. People don't write a commentary on Deuteronomy to get rich. But I really believe that that's the most important thing I could do in writing right now. Because if people don't understand the brilliance of the Bible, we're doomed. Because people will then get their wisdom from college and not from the Bible. And the colleges are teaching nonsense by and large, I'm sorry to say. How are we? Around 26 minutes. Okay, so we're good. Okay. Tristan, 12 years old, Muskego, Wisconsin. Hi, Dennis Otto, all Megans, Snoopy, and Nate the Great, who isn't here, but I'll, I'll share this. I've watched almost 200 episodes of your chats, and I want to know your thoughts on kids sitting on electronics all day and not taking a break. Thank you for your answer. I think you know my thoughts, and I think I know your thoughts. I don't know if we know yet all the consequences of the preoccupation with staring at one's phone, but it's, it's not a good thing. Everybody knows it's not a good thing. Anybody who thinks about it knows it's not a good thing. I'll give you a, a little example. It's not exactly about, uh, it's about electronics, but it's not, what did you say? Sitting on electronics all day. Okay. I have uh, worked out at gyms much of my life. And I remember decades ago being at the gym and it was common for the, uh, the members to, you know, talk to one another in, in between exercises, let's say. Oh, how you doing? What are you doing? Well, you know, what, what are you working on? Or whatever it might be. Over time... I see nobody talk to anybody at the gym. No one. Maybe if you have a trainer, but most people, they're doing it on their own. And pretty much nobody's talking to anybody. So a lot of people today, they're either wearing headphones or AirPods. Correct? I, I'm, not in the, uh, uh, I'm not in the Apple world. I wear earphones when I do my radio show. So that's why I think ear. Most people don't think earphones unless they're audiophiles. Anyway, uh, the point is they're all, they're all into their worlds of being entertained by something else. So obviously, who, who's going to walk over to a person who has something in their ear or, or something covering their ear, right? And I just think that that's unfortunate. But the, the bigger question is the one you're talking about. Electronics all day. It, it, there is an art to relating to people. It is one of the great joys of life to relate to other people. We are meant to relate to other people. To the extent that electronics diminishes the time that we would have spent talking to a person, a friend, a relative, family member. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a real problem. So I don't have anything brilliant to add that hasn't been said by many others about the crisis of the immersion in the, in the world of electronics. But uh, when I'm in line at the airport, I talk, I try to talk to people in line. I think it's a beautiful thing to talk to strangers. It's a habit of mine. It is a habit I cultivate. It's a good thing for me. It's a good thing for the person. But if, you're, if the person is just staring down at their phone and typing away, you're not, you're not likely to start talking to them. And was it truly critical that 
that be done? They couldn't wait till perhaps they sat down on the plane and did it. Uh, it it's a it's a worrisome problem. And and by the way, I think it takes away from another thing. How how old are you? Let's see, you're twelve. How many young people, forget 12, 18, 25, are reading books? I can't imagine a life without book reading. That people who lived before you, or are living now for that matter, worked very hard to put their thoughts or some history or some poetry or some novel together to touch another person's life. It's a very valuable thing, book reading. I think the electronics issue is a serious one. You do too, or you wouldn't have asked the question. Anyway, please remember that whatever you give till Christmas is tripled as a donation to PragerU. Thank you, and I'll see you next week. Many of them are wearing headphones while they work out or, or, or ear pods and listening to music or whatever they're listening to. Is not such a thing, ear pods? No. Oh, yeah. I think you said ear pods. I did. Air pods. Oh, air pods. <laughs> okay. So, uh, th- they're, they're, so we'll start that again. So what they're doing is they have headphones on or air pods. Uh, I say ear because it's earphones for audio files. Earlier you said air earbuds instead of earbuds. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, which should I say? No, it's AirPods. But remember when you were talking about eardrum? You uh, accidentally said eardrum. Oh my god! Uh, no, I know that. <laughs> yeah. We'll start this okay. again. <laughs> so what people are doing now? Not everybody, but a lot of people are wearing headphones or ear pods. Uh, oh, that's wrong. So a lot of people today, they're either wearing headphones or air pods, correct? I, I'm, not in the, uh, uh, I'm not in the Apple world. Six million Jews were murdered. They weren't murdered because they were criminals or did anything wrong, just because they were Jews. My name is Joseph Alexander, and this is my story. I was born in 1923. I'm now 107 months. I'm a Holocaust survivor from Poland. I come from a small town named Kowal. We had a very good family. We were very close, but my father was in business, and we were doing very good. We were called modern Orthodox. Matter of fact, we had a synagogue in our house. We had a very good life in 1939 until the Germans came into Poland. Everything fell apart. Until then, we in Poland, we had no problem. After a few weeks, the Germans came to town and told the people they have 10 minutes to get their possessions and get out in the middle of the square. And they took them away. They came out to order, all the Jewish men from 16 to 60 report to the schoolhouse. So I report to the schoolhouse and off I went to the camps. So the first camp I went to, we were building a dam. The work we do was very hard work. And the food you were getting was a piece of bread like this in the morning and a cup of coffee, and you went to work. So people were dying. From that food, you couldn't survive. The next camp I was, I was laying cobblestones on the street. Then I moved to another camp. We were building sewers. We were laying big cement pipes on the ground. These were the uniforms we were wearing in some of the camps, not all of them. Then I moved to another camp. I was a roofer doing roofs. And so far, going from camp to camp, after being in seven camps, 
a train arrived, and it wasn't a passenger train, you know, the cattle car train, where they put 30, 40 people to one box car. In the destination we were going, it takes maybe five, six hours at the most. When we were riding around for three days, no food, no water, no facilities, nothing. Finally, we arrived in Auschwitz, and I met Dr. Joseph Mengele. You know, Dr. Mengele called Doctor of Death. He selected people for human experiment. He's going to select some people to go to the left. The people on the left are going to be taken on trucks. So he went through, and he picked out sick people, old people, young kids, and I was a little guy, and so told me to go to the left. If I would come from home, I wouldn't know the difference. But I was already in seven camps, and most of the camps I was. Every time I had to go to work, I tried to get in with a group with the biggest, strongest man. And here I look around, I see sick people, old people, young kids. That's not the kind of people I like to be with. But my luck was, it was after midnight. It would have been daytime. I don't know if I could have done it. When Dr. Mengele moved further down, I ran back to the other side. I didn't run back to the other side. I wouldn't be here talking to you today because the people were taken on trucks. Found out, they went straight to the guest chamber. And I walked to Auschwitz and I went to Auschwitz, I got a shower, came out of the shower, and I got a tattoo. It's one, one, four, two, five, eight, four. From that moment on, you had no name anymore. This was your name. In the morning, the same train arrived, and we got on the train, and we were on the train for three and a half days. Same thing, no food, no water, no facilities. And we went to Germany to a camp named Dachau. Dachau was the first camp Hitler built in 1933 for political prisoners. Then he turned it into a concentration camp with the guest chamber. I saw people being beaten to death. I saw people run into the electric fence to get electrocuted. And the next morning, what they called, we were going on a death march. They're supposed to take us into the mountain, and they're supposed to kill us in the mountain. So we walked for about two days. We could hear the fighting going on, so we knew that the American troops were not far behind us. The American tank moved in, and we were liberated. And behind the tank were the American troops, I was 21 when I was liberated. I had my parents, I had three sisters and two brothers, and I'm the only survivor. Family means everything to me. You have no idea what I would have given just, just, just to have one brother or sister survive even. So I got on a boat and I came to New York in May 30th, 1949. When I came to New York, I was about 25. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. That's the best country in the world. If I couldn't live in the United States, I would go to Israel. If we would have had Israel at that time, that Holocaust would never happen. Yes, I kept my faith. I know a lot of people a lot of survivors said they don't, they didn't believe in God because well, they were asking where was God when the Holocaust happened. But I say God works in mysterious ways. If we don't speak about the Holocaust, then people will forget what happened. I've talked to hundreds of high school students, 70% of them never heard about the Holocaust. Six million Jews were murdered. They weren't murdered because they were criminals or did anything wrong, just because they were Jews. 
And now we still have a lot of anti-Semitism going on and the Holocaust deniers. The most important thing is true education. To let them know what happened and to get them educated because the young people there are there are our future. Some of the students asked me, did you ever did you ever thought of giving up? I said no, I never thought of giving up. I never lost faith. I never stopped believing in God. And I used to say to myself, I may have a bad day today, but I hope tomorrow be a better day. But never give up. Hi, everybody. Fireside chat number. 224. 224. Wow, I thought it was 222. Boy, life goes by. I can date my life by fireside chats. <laughs> Number 224. Hi, I'm Dennis Prager. This is Otto, America's most famous dog. He, he, it has not uh, in any way gone to his head. And that's because he has a very good upbringing here, right, Mr. O? Very good. Now, the question is, will Otto stay the entire chat? It has been his want in, in the last few months to get up and leave when he felt like it. And no amount of bribery seems to work. Anyway, welcome to the fireside chat. A few things, and then I take your questions. So a few things, uh, not in any order of importance, uh, but just uh, I'm th reminded yesterday was Groundhog Day. And that is one of my two, three favorite films ever made. If you haven't seen Groundhog Day, I surely recommend it to you. It is a profound movie and a funny movie. To be profound and funny at the same time is quite an achievement. The acting, the writing, the directing, they're all superb. And the, the ultimate lesson is that you've got to get it right. You keep repeating errors and repeating errors. Groundhog Day keeps repeating in the movie. And until he gets it right, he can't move on to the next day. And that, in, in a certain sense, is, is true for all of us. It's true for everybody. You don't realize it, but everybody has a Groundhog Day. Everybody has things. You ever, you ever think... Oh, my God, I just keep repeating the same mistake. Everybody has said that. So, in effect, the movie is about don't repeat the same mistake. You can't move on until you decide not to repeat the same mistake. So, it's a great lesson. There are many great lessons to it. And I thought I'd share it with you because I don't normally talk about movies, though I will acknowledge that when I see what I really enjoy, I really enjoy it. Next item is the Canadian uh, truckers' strike. Just a few words about that. The people upon whom modern society is dependent for their food and just about everything else that they have in life, truckers, the contempt with, with, with which uh, truck drivers uh, have now been uh, dealt with is astonishing. I don't blame them for their anger. They're in a cab alone nearly all of their time, except when they're sleeping. And they they have to get vaccinated, even if they have been already afflicted with COVID, even if they already had COVID. By the way, uh, it is now universally acknowledged that between the two, uh, you are less likely to be seriously hurt by COVID or even get COVID again if you have natural immunity, meaning you had COVID as opposed to a vaccine. They say that the two are even better, may well be. But between the two, uh, that is between natural immunity, i.e. having had COVID, and the vaccine, natural immunity uh, is stronger. So if a trucker, let's say, had natural immunity, why should he have to uh, have a vaccine? A lot of these truckers are, well, truckers go in all age groups, but a lot of them are young. Young people are overwhelmingly not likely to be hurt by COVID. 
Why do, why should any of them, trucker or not trucker, be forced to get a vaccine or lose their livelihood? This is a monstrosity that governments have created. You will not be able to feed your family or yourself if you uh, if you do not get a vaccine. It's 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 unprecedented, and it's it's immoral. It's truly immoral. What has been done to young people being used as experiments is unconscionable. But anyway, I've talked about that a lot. I've a hundred percent sympathy with the truckers who are being bullied by uh, a man for whom I, I have no respect, the Prime Minister of Canada, who strikes me as a nothing. And I hate using these words. It's not like me, but I don't like when people who have nothing, nothing deep about them become tyrants. And that, that's what I believe is the case in Canada. Most Canadians have gone along with it, which is very scary, as so many Americans have gone along with the idea that people should be fired. Even firefighters, even police, uh, even doctors, even nurses, if they, if they, for whatever reason, do not get a vaccine, have they been killing people so far? It's like the masks on planes. Why is that? There was a time when there were no masks on planes. Were they killing people? It's the purest air you could breathe outside of, a, of perhaps a hospital special room, the air on an airplane. You think pilots wear masks? How's that for a pretty important question? Of course they don't wear masks. A, a, pilot may not tell you because he's afraid to get in trouble, but pilots open up to me because they know who I am. They don't wear masks. The second that door closes, they take their masks off. Thank God they do. I don't want them breathing their own air for six hours. To be perfectly honest, I want them breathing fresh air. And by the way, why aren't you killed when the next guy to you, the guy next to you on the plane, takes off his or her mask to have some food? What is it? While people eat, you can't kill anybody. I mean, we are living in the age of the absurd, the absurd, and people believe it. So I uh, now, what about the truckers and swastikas? and urinating on, on the tomb of the unknown soldier. Uh, okay, uh, with regard to the swastika and the Confederate flag, uh, if I had to bet, I would bet that these are provocateurs who came into it with those flags. It's hard for me to believe that a Canadian trucker somehow got a Confederate flag to wave. What, is the, what does Canada have to do with the Confederacy? Okay, it, it, nothing. So it, it's a little hard to believe. Uh, uh, and they did catch one of the guys who had, uh, who had a swastika or the only guy to have a swastika. And it, you can see it on, on the internet. His face is completely covered. He wanted to be completely anonymous. I don't mean just a mask, no eyes. So uh, this guy was obviously there just to give the truckers a bad name. Uh, these are, these are called false flags for the obvious reason that they're false flags. And by the way, even if it was true, and even if pe some people acted awfully, the press is so dishonest in saying that these are representative. All you hear about is peeing on the national monument of the <coughs> tomb of the unknown soldier. Yeah, Otto, Otto got upset, and I don't, I don't blame him. He's a sensitive dog. And so I think as soon as he hears peeing, I think that's what did it, actually. I don't think it was the tomb of the unknown soldier that got him upset. Uh, this is all the way our mainstream media is dishonesty. For two years, American media told you about collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. It, it was all, it was two years of lying. Two years. So I'm supposed to trust them on the reporting from Canada? By the way, it's interesting just to give you an example, the Associated Press article. Oh, here he goes. Oh, how sad. Nate the Great is currently opening the door. I feel like an announcer. Otto is moving toward the door at this time and has left the fireside chat. Anyway, we still have the fireside and the crew and me. So the Associated Press reported on the Canadian truckers and spoke about swastika and Confederate flag. Wall Street Journal 
news article on it did not mention either once. It shows you how different reporting is. It, if you want to smear anything that the left doesn't agree with, they will find re- there is no, it is not possible to have any large scale demonstration, protest, and not have some truly bad apples in the middle. It is not possible. Okay? But you don't judge all a whole group by its bad apples. That's the point. In either direction. And finally, uh, Whoopi Goldberg uh, said on The View that, I'm paraphrasing, that... uh, the Holocaust was not a racist, a mass a murder of the Jews, uh, because the Jews are white, and this was just man's inhumanity to man. So this was not this was not an issue of, of race. The Jews are not a race. So I I was on OAN TV, and they asked me about it. And I think somewhat to their surprise, uh, I said two things. One, she apologized. And I said, unlike the left, we on the right accept apologies. If we think you're sincere and you apologized, people move on. Nobody in public life has said, has not said anything that they regret. It is not possible. I have a pretty high track record for someone on for 40 years on radio and a thousand columns. I'm very careful. I'm very outspoken, but I'm very careful. But uh, it is impossible literally impossible not to say anything wrong uh, if you're a public figure. It's not possible. And people should be open on both sides. So I, 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 am, uh, I have no problem as a Jew, as, a, as an American, as a human, in saying I accept your apology, Whoopi Goldberg. But even more interesting is to tell you that there was some truth in what she said. The Jews are not a race. That is true. There are white Jews and black Jews, Arab Jews. Uh, 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 There's every ethnic Jew. And you can convert to becoming a Jew. And you're as much a Jew as a 50th generation Jew. You can't convert to a race, but you can convert to being a Jew because you convert through the religion. Jews are somewhat unique in that they are both a religion and a people. So it confuses two groups, Jews and non-Jews, meaning everybody are confused. So what are Jews? Well, Jews are a religion and a people. They're they're never called a religion in, in the Bible. They're called a people. Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel, or Bnei Yisrael, the children of Israel. Israel is the name of Jacob. So it, it's it, ironically, she was right. The Jews are not a race. The part that she was wrong in is it was racism in part that animated Hitler. Hitler said the world is divided between Aryans and non-Aryans. The Jews are non-Aryans and the Jews alone deserve to be exterminated. He persecuted gypsies, he persecuted gays, he persecuted Slavs, he persecuted Russians, or, or you might say our Slavs, uh, but he, he exterminated Jews. And I made the point on this TV show, and in my book, Why the Jews, which I think you would find incredibly interesting, because it explains all of this. It's called Why the Jews, one of my first books. It's in its third edition that Jew hatred called anti-Semitism, Jew hatred is unique. All other bigotries are, are bigotries, are prejudices, are even persecutions, but they're not, they don't have as their goal extermination. Jew haters want to exterminate Jews. The, the slave, slavery was not built on extermination. Killing a black for a slaver was a bad idea. They lost their investment. Blacks were deemed inferior. Otherwise, they couldn't be kidnapped and enslaved, but not worthy of extermination. So it, it, it's, which is not 
does not in any way saying slavery is anything but vile and evil, but there are levels of evil, I, I, gradations of evil in life, and extermination is the worst. And that's what the Jews have been uh, targeted for. There is a line in the Passover service. In every generation, someone arises to exterminate us. Exterminate us. That's the Hebrew. By the way, that service I have a book coming out on because it's the most important holiday in history, Passover. And I could explain that. Maybe we'll do that Passover time. I think you'll find that interesting. That was the last supper of Jesus, by the way, was a Passover Seder. So it's, it's really it's really central to Christians. If you want to understand this, it's coming out momentarily. The the uh, the rational Passover Haggadah. I have the rational Bible, and now I have this. It's explaining a, a lot about life, like I do with the rational Bible. I think, I don't think, I am sure that you will benefit from it, whether you're a Jew, a Christian, or an atheist, or a Buddhist, or whatever. So now I go to your questions, and here we go. Usually they're in their 20s. My guess is that this questioner is not. Let's see if I'm right. Good evening, Mr. Freider. My name is Richard Orr. I'm 79 years old. I was born and raised in Southern California. I'm a veteran. I served in the uh, United States Air Force. I was in during 1960 to 1965, during the Vietnam War, the Cold War, and the Cuban crisis. And I was very proud to be in the military. What brings to mind today a question I have is about uh, honoring your mother and your father. As a young man, uh, a young boy, I was, uh, I've seen things with, that my parents did to me and my brother and my sisters that would probably put them in jail today. And I don't uh, dislike them uh, and I don't uh, hate them. Uh, but when it comes to honor, um, not real sure, I, I, and I'm troubled by that, and it bothers me. Do I have to be a good person to show that I honor my mother and father? Or do my parents have to be good parents uh, to show that I would honor them? So um, that's my question, and I appreciate your time. Well, it's a great one, and, and a lot of people have that question, and I blew it. I can't believe it. I so was gentle and lifted. Okay, so you are not the only person to pose that question to me. It's a very important one to a lot of people. So I have, uh, I've taught the Ten Commandments all of my life. My mission in life, in a nutshell, is to get the world to live by the Ten Commandments. You want to defund the police? Just have people observe the Ten Commandments. Then you can defund the police. How's that? You can empty the jails for that matter. So one of them is honor your father and mother. And it, in some ways, it's the most important of the Ten Commandments, believe it or not. And my way of knowing that is this. Every totalitarian regime, every cult... The first thing it does is minimize or erase parental authority. Because if you get, if you listen to your parents, you won't listen to the party or listen to the regime or listen to the dictator. They all go after parental authority. It's one of the reasons I know that the left is dangerous. It undermines a parental authority in the state of Washington. You can now, uh, uh, you can now uh, get uh, get transgender medical attention without your parents' knowledge, let alone consent. Such as if a girl, a teenage girl, wants her breasts removed, 
Imagine that. A 15-year-old but doesn't want to tell her parents, or if you wish his parents, whatever pronoun you wish to use is not of interest to me. What's interest to me is parents have no say. Increasingly, parents have no say. That's what uh, lost the uh, gubernatorial race in Virginia. When uh, uh, McAuliffe said uh, that uh, who are parents to decide what their kids study in school? And that's a perfectly legit, quote unquote, progressive view. Who the hell are you parents to determine what your children study? So what are parents for exactly? In many, in many areas, uh, the schools give the kids breakfast. The school gives the kids lunch. Parents aren't even there to give their kids meals. They're not there to determine their, their, uh, their lives, their education, or anything. They, so it's very dangerous when parental authority is undermined. But what if your parent is a jerk? What if your parent is bad? Richard said his, his uh, dad would be in jail today for what he did to him and his siblings. I don't know what your dad did, so I, that would be important to me to know what was done. However, let me explain something. You said you don't hate or even dislike your father. You're, you're totally permitted by the Ten Commandments to hate or dislike your father. That's the irony. Honor your parent doesn't mean love them. This is one of the great geniuses of the, of the f- five books that I'm writing my commentary on, the first five books of the Bible. There's a commandment to love your neighbor. There's a commandment to love the stranger. There's a commandment to love God. There's no commandment to love your parent. You don't have to love your parent. If you do, that's, that's gravy. That's icing on the cake, whatever other cliche you want to use. But you don't have to. What does honor mean? Well, I'll give you an example. Let us say there was a commandment, as there should be, honor the police. But what if there's a really terrible policeman who beats honest, uh, uh, honest citizens up? Okay, so clearly we punish him, but we keep the law of honoring the police. That there are exceptionally bad parents, I understand, but the law remains that the per- parental authority is sacred. So do you have to honor a, a, a horrible parent who abused you sexually or, or, uh, or just physically? So what does then honor mean? Honor is not a feeling. Honor is a behavior. Now, of, what is the famous phrase in law school? Bad cases make bad law. The fact that there will always be an exception. Here, you're supposed to stop at a red light. Okay, what if the guy in your car has a heart attack and there were no cars coming in the other direction? Would you go through a red light? I would. But it doesn't establish any principle about not obeying red lights. We honor our parents. Are there parents who are so awful that they are as exceptional as the guy having a heart attack in your car? Yes, there are. So I I can't tell you what to do. That's between you and God. I can only say that I saw in my father, who was not molested by his mother, but who was yelled at every time he called her, which was every day of the week. I saw a phenomenal model of honoring a parent through my father. My father called his mother every every day of the week. And often I was privy to it because he did it from the kitchen. In those days, you know, you didn't have cell phones. It was wherever there was a phone, you made a call. Well, we had one in the kitchen. So he'd sit at the table and he'd call her and all I'd hear is yelling. I didn't understand what she was yelling uh, because she talked to him in Yiddish, uh, not in uh, not in English. That was her language. Uh, but I knew she was yelling at him. So he called his mother every day to get yelled at. <laughs> and it, it was so bad, he would actually put the phone on the table while she was yelling. And so all of us would hear the yelling. <laughs> And for me, it was gobbledygook. I didn't know what she, it, I know she wasn't yelling, I love you, believe me. And uh, and every so often, my father would pick up the phone and go, yeah, ma, yeah, ma. And then he put it back down and more yelling. It made a very big impression upon me. 
Wow. She's a tough lady. She, I'll tell you how tough she was. This is going to crack you up, all of you. This grandmother uh, spoke a little English when she spoke to me, because I, I didn't know Yiddish. So I was about eight years old. I was on the phone with her. And she says to me, I don't know what provoked it, your mother is a Hitler, which is pretty remarkable for, this is not long after the Holocaust, <laughs> and it's a Jewish family. <laughs> your, your mother is Hitler. <laughs> so I, here is where, is one of these signposts that I, I knew I had a very easygoing nature. Not only was I not blown away and pained, I thought it was hilarious. I put my hand on the phone, on you know, on the talking part, and I go, Dad, Dad, Grandma called Mom Hitler. <laughs> he thought it was hilarious too. I mean, my, you know, me, I could Mussolini. I get get I, I I would get that. She was a, a difficult. She was. She was a great human being, and but a, a very, very tyrannical mother, which is fine. I'm not complaining. Uh, but uh, Hitler was a little over the top, I have to say. Uh, in, in any event, uh, this was a tough woman. And I saw the way my father treated her. And why? Because he believed God instructed him to honor his father and mother. His father was easy to honor. His father was a very lovable, easygoing guy whom I never knew. He died when I was two. But that's what I am told. So I can't answer, uh, Richard. I can't. An I can't tell you in your specific case. I could only tell you that honor does not have anything to do with with feelings. It has to do with behavior, and that normally speaking, even tough parents deserve a certain type of honor. There are exceptions. I I acknowledge that fact. So uh, I hope I hope that's helpful to everybody. I, I give you one more example. I, I did not like uh, the president, Jimmy Carter. I didn't, I, I, even though I believe it or not, I voted for him. It was the last time I voted Democrat. I was raised a Democrat. And I voted for him. And, but it doesn't matter. I, I, did, I came to not care for the man. But it turns out that he was in a, my radio studio in Los Angeles shortly after leaving the presidency are being interviewed by the host before me. And when, uh, when he walked in, uh, I, uh, I stood up. Now, I didn't stand up for Jimmy Carter. I stood up for the President of the United States. So I, I hope that also might, might, might explain a little bit about this. So that was big. Let me take one more. Let's see what we can do here. All right. Owen, 13 years old in Woodenville, Washington. Hi, Mr. Prager. The world is an uncertain place right now, and your fireside chats fill me, fill me in and give me faith that there are still good people in society. I'm glad there are. At school, 95% of the students do not like me for being Republican. I do wear USA hats and Trump hats to school. What would be your recommendation to show the kids that I am a better person than they see me as? Thank you and God bless you. Well, believe it or not, and a lot of you won't agree with me, which I can I can handle. I'm a big boy. I don't think it's wise to wear a Trump hat to school. And I voted for Donald Trump passionately uh, twice. I thought he was a great president. Uh, and he's a, he's a difficult man, but he was a great president. Uh, but I would not wear a, tr a Trump hat. And I'll tell you why. You have to ask what is effective, not what feels good. It might feel good that, and, and you have guts to do that. I salute you to do that by that you're doing that. I just want to make that clear. But in order to be effective, don't immediately announce your position. First, let them know you. By wearing a Trump hat, they don't know you. They know your hat. You want them to know you as the good person that I presume you are. And then, oh, what was this? Owen, yes. Oh, oh yeah, Owen, yeah, he, he's our friend. We, we, we just went to the movies with him or we, you know, we just uh, watched, the, watched the football game together. And then gradually, at times, just let them know what your position might be. 
like you're in Washington State? You know, guys, do you really think it would be a good idea to defund the police? Don't, don't, don't more innocent people get killed? By the way, disproportionately, uh, blacks get killed when we defund the police? You know, uh, blacks don't want to defund the police. Every poll done is actually more whites want to defund the police than blacks. How's that for an irony? So you let your positions out in a very sophisticated way, but the moment you wear a hat that announces the uh, the most uh, triggering, to use their term, a thing you could do, they're not going to know you. I want them to know you and then find out that this guy that they like, Owen, has positions that differ from theirs. That That's, I think, the best way to go about it. And with that, amazing, these fireside chats come to an end. See you next week. On behalf of the missing Otto, thanks for watching. Did you know that the New York Times avoided reporting about the Holocaust during the war? This entity known as the Paper of Record lied to the world about Stalin's brutality, the effects of the bomb on Japan, and more recently, COVID's origin. Has the New York Times ever been objective or honest? Ashley Rinsberg illustrates in this conversation that the answer is no. So why do so many Americans still trust this gray lady? I want to start by saluting you for your courage. And the listeners are about to realize why you took on the gray lady, the New York Times. Thank you. Yeah. What led you to do that? I think it was just uh, a really deep feeling that something is wrong. Something is wrong with the newspaper and something's wrong with the notion that we all put our faith in this institution blindly. We, we assume that if it comes from the New York Times, therefore it's credible. But what I started to see in the world and partly from being in Israel in the late part of the Intifada in 2002 or three was that just wasn't true. The reality and the reporting didn't match. Um, and that sort of got inside me and I wanted to understand it. You know, what's so interesting about your book is I think people, especially around me, keep saying, oh, once upon a time, you could trust the news, right? Once upon a time, you could and you pick up the New York Times or turn on CNN and get unbiased news. And that's actually not true. It turns out when you study actually history and you actually dive into your book, you realize that even my parents should not have actually trusted the New York Times. And we're going to get into all of those examples. But just fast forward to what is happening today as we speak. We have Tucker Carlson being fired from Fox. We have Don Lemon being fired from CNN. Mm -hmm. Like, what is going on? Yeah, it's uh, the media is in, in the state of crisis. I think there's an economic crisis that they're dealing with. And they are dealing also with something that they call the trust crisis. But the trust crisis, when they use that terminology, puts the burden on us. We don't trust them enough. Ugh. The reality is it's a reliability crisis. They ha are no longer reliable. And the public understands that. And that's on both sides of the aisle. We sort of understand now that there are agendas at work, that there are narratives that are being constructed to suit the needs of those agendas. And they are scrambling. They don't know what to do. Because for basically the last 80, 100 years, they've enjoyed the privilege of our trust and they no longer have it. One of the things, as I think about what has just happened recently with, you know, the firing from legacy media, and I read your book at the same time, I think about this idea that if they were actually capitalist, if these news organizations were less of these ideologues and actually were more focused on building a business, then they would satisfy a larger customer base, right? Like if I ran CNN, I would call Tucker Carlson right now and I would say, hey, come over and let me get your audience. And then my audience would grow even further. And if CNN actually did that, not only would they probably make more money because they would have a larger audience, but they would actually do a favor to Americans because they would provide two perspectives so that Americans can actually go ahead and make their own decisions. But they're not capitalist. They're ideologues. And they've always been ideologues. And the New York Times has always been about ideology, not necessarily about managing a good business. 
Do you see that connection too? For sure. I mean, today with the media, especially with the economic headwinds that they're facing, and since Google has basically eaten all their ad revenue, this would be the moment to rethink how they approach their market mm -hmm. and how they serve their customer and who the customer is. That's the other thing. I think for, for a lot of media today, the customer is the political establishment. And the actual customer, the audience, is just kind of a byproduct. It's just a, a means of serving that upstream customer that they're really ideologically aligned to. And it's, of course, about being part of this set of people who think alike and they want to prove their bona fides to each other. Mm -hmm. But the Times, um, the Times did have somewhat of a capitalist approach to things, and it led to some of their very disastrous decision-making. But what we've seen in the last 10, 15 years, and certainly that's accelerated in the last five years, is, is that they've thrown out that out the window and they've taken a political approach, which is about serving the base. 3% of their readership that is willing to be uh, to become subscribers. And that 3% is increasingly extreme in their views. They're younger and they're more woke and more millennial. And the Times is scampering after them to try to serve them. And what that means is that they're giving up the rest of the 97% of the audience who are thinking, what is going on here? Why do you think they're doing that? I mean, if, if they know that they're actually catering towards a more extreme base, is it because they only believe that the base would actually pay a recurring fee and that's what they need to capitalize on? Partly, yeah. The entire, uh, let's say, newspaper-based news media has been has flipped the model from advertising-based, which is kind of democratic because every set of eyeballs is worth the same amount as every other set of eyeballs. But when they moved to subscription-based model, that meant that the people who are willing to pay, not just a few months or a few years, but for 20 to 30 years, you got to get those real true believers, the fundamentalists. Mm. Um, and that's exactly what happened. And the 1619 Project was quite expressly a response, a tactic for them to attract this new kind of subscriber that would really fire them up and say, I need this. I need this so much. I'm going to pay you mm -hmm. every single month indefinitely. Your book, The Gray Lady Winked, talks about how a family started the New York Times. Uh, you talk a little bit about their background and the kind of impact they have on the way America thinks about virtually everything, right? It's the paper of record. And there's this one family that has such a strong influence mm -hmm. on even on our policies, our decision making. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the first story that you talk about here, which is how the New York Times got the reporting on the Holocaust. Wrong is an understatement. <laughs> yeah. Who owned the New York Times? What's their background? And and how did they cover the Holocaust? Yeah, they're called the Sulzberger family today. They still control the paper. They're, um, it's a public company, but they have a two-tier stock structure and they have special stocks that um, gives them control of the paper that cannot be taken from them. They trace back to the founder of this dynasty, and it is a dynasty. This is one of the great American uh, business dynasties that still exists today. Uh, we kind of think about the Rothschilds and the Vanderbilts who are basically all gone. This one still remains. And by the way, it is a literal patriarchy. They pass that baton of the chairman of the paper and the publisher of the newspaper, chairman of the New York Times Company, from male heir to male heir to male heir for 120 years. There's not been someone who is not a white male, to speak in New York Times terminology, for over a century. So these are, um, they were started by Ox, Ox Sulzberger, who's a German Jewish immigrant to the United States. And after him, it was handed back with a brief stopover through his son-in-law to another son-in-law named Sulzberger. Mm -hmm. And Sulzberger was the guy who kind of really took the paper in this real drastic direction, including with the, the World War II stuff, where they were reporting on Nazi Germany in a way that was so favorable to the Nazis that they would just read New York Times reporting on German broadcasts without changing the reports or censoring them. These are German Jews that own the New York Times, and you're saying that they didn't report about the Holocaust. Why would they not report about the Holocaust? They're Jewish. What what yeah. what interest would they have to support the Nazis? There's two separate issues there. One was their the support of the Nazis was because they had a Nazi sympathizer running their Berlin bureau during World War II and, and a lead up to World War II. That guy was 
His name is Guido Anderas. He was loved by Nazi brass because of the way he reported on Germany. And so he got really great access. He got access to the top people. He got great stories, got great scoops. And the Times knew this. They knew about his sympathies for the Nazis. But this is back to their capitalist bent. They didn't want to give up that access. They wanted to be number one. They wanted the Pulitzers, which they won for their pro-German reporting during World War II. They won two Pulitzers. Um, the Holocaust stuff was about them not wanting to be seen as a Jewish newspaper, as Jewish owned. Because this was America in the 1940s. There was a lot of anti-Semitism. They were afraid that it would jeopardize their position in the market. And for them, that was just not something they would sacrifice even for the truth. So they actually forbade the word Jew from appearing in reports, news reports during that period. And in one in instance, which was the liberation of Auschwitz, they did a big story. And the word Jew didn't appear in that story. And that was the extent to which they were willing to go to keep the paper <laughs> sort of free of uh, Jewish influence or the appearance of any kind of Jewish slant. It was so important for them to feel like they can belong and fit in that they were actually willing to sell their own Jewish brethren who yeah. are out there in Germany being slaughtered. That was the ideological part for them, which is that they kind of subscribed to this, this approach to the Jewish faith, which for them meant that there was no such thing as Jewish people as an ethnicity or a nation. There was just Jewish worship. Like you would go to a church and I would go to a synagogue and we're just all the same. And for them, what was happening in Europe was just happening to Europeans, not to Jews per se. So that was an ideological commitment that they made and that's something that they all believed in. And it was about um, not wanting to be seen as being different. And it was also about not wanting to lose their, their leading position in the market. How did they write articles about the Holocaust without mentioning the Jews? What did they write about? They just didn't write about the Holocaust. That was the, the easy solution that they took. Or if they did, it would be in incredibly small articles that were buried in the back pages. So in one case that I talked about in the book, they did a story about the murder of 700,000 Jews in Europe. And they gave that something like three, four inches of calm space, and they buried it on page five. And the same day's edition, with the front page had a story about one man in Iceland being killed. That was the way they did it. Say, sure, we're covering it, but without really covering it. Six years, they did six front page stories about the Holocaust. That's unbelievable. And you're saying they won two Pulitzer Prizes? Did they ever apologize or, no. you know, come out with a statement saying we were wrong? They they did some sort of like in the, in the 70s, they did a like retrospective look at their Holocaust <laughs> like coverage by 30 not, years later. Yes. And, and it was just one article, but they never uh, they never corrected the record for the Nazi, the pro Nazi reporting. They've never actually spoken about that. The other example you bring up in your book uh, is what happened between Russia and the Ukraine. Holodomor. Yeah. I yeah. would imagine that a lot of the people listening don't know that much about Holodomor. I didn't either. So can you tell me a little bit what happened there and when was it? Holodomor is the Ukraine famine. That is um, a famine is kind of, it's not really the right way to describe it. It was a campaign of genocide created by Stalin to consolidate power and to sort of do what Stalin did, which is to express his wrath politically on vulnerable people, in this case, peasants in the Ukraine. He starved five to seven million people to death in a period of two years. It was 1931, 1932. And for Ukrainian people today, that is for them what Jews think of as the Holocaust. That is that magnitude. It affects them. It affects their family lives today. They still think about it and feel it. But the New York Times decided not to cover it, not just to not cover it, but to deny it. So other reporters were saying, this is happening at the time. And the New York Times reporter, Walter Durand, he said, there is no famine. There is no such thing. And that's how they reported on it. And they won a Pulitzer for that reporting. They have been called upon to return that Pulitzer to amend the record and to sort of repent journalistically, but they've refused to do that. Why? I well, I guess both why. Why did they refuse to do it? But then why did they report a lie? It was really incumbent upon them to help this group of business people in New York City push for the United States to officially recognize the Soviet government. 
It had been 16 years by that point since the Soviet Revolution. The United States had not recognized the Soviets as the legitimate government of Russia. And what that meant is that this sort of syndicate of businesses based in New York was not able to access that market for import or for export. That was a huge market. It was 150 million plus people rapidly industrializing. It was an incredible opportunity, but you couldn't trade with that market anymore because there were no diplomatic relations. So the New York Times was actually pushing FDR when he was still governor, just months before he became president, to do that, to recognize the Soviets. And this was not something FDR could do if that same government had just murdered 5 million of its own people for no reason. Mm. So you just kind of easily, glibly whitewash the record in real time. And when it came time to do that recognition, he did it. And there was a gala event at the Waldorf Astoria in New York where the who's who of American politics and business were in attendance, all the banks, the railroads, etc. Only one man got a standing ovation that night, and that was Walter Duranty. It was the guy who covered up. The guy who lied about the fact yes. that Ukrainians were literally starving to death. Yes. Because they all knew, everyone in that room knew that it would never have happened without Durante's sacrifice. His unquote, lies. His lies. And when it came out as a lie and they were expected to return the prize, why didn't they return the prize, given that they know it's a lie? <laughs> I think that's a great question. Um, Ukraine, Ukrainian-American community in America started to push really hard around uh, the early 2000s to address this. And... The Times went out and hired a consultant, they called him as a historian, to assess the situation. Big surprise, the guy came back and said, you should return the prize. And then they said no. Uh, they said that to do that would be kind of like airbrushing history, which is a bizarre explanation. Isn't it the opposite of airbrushing it's history? It's the opposite, yeah. So they had already airbrushed history, and this would be to correct the record. Um, why did they really do that? I think because they understand that to give back one prize would open up the can of worms to say, okay, well, what about the World War II stuff? And what about the stuff you, the, the reporting for uh, weapons of mass destruction that got a Pulitzer? What about this or that or that or that? There is a lot to correct. I, I did a story about, um, I think it was at least seven Pulitzers that I count that the New York Times won incorrectly or illegitimately that really should be given back. I mean, these are clear cut cases. So they don't want to go down that road. Well, I think there is a difference between news entities that have reported a mistake by accident yeah. versus news entities that actually know that they're lying about things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what we're talking about here is that they knew that the Holocaust was happening, yeah. but because they didn't want to be associated with the Jews, they didn't report on it. Right. They knew that Holodomor was happening between Russia and Ukraine, but because they wanted to make Russia happy, they lied about it. And on to the next one is what happened in Japan. So it's another example where they knew that they were reporting a lie, mm -hmm. but they still went ahead and did that. That was actually quite remarkable because it was, this isn't like, uh, maybe they did, maybe they did. They did actually work with the War Department uh, they sent their star science reporter, William Lawrence, and they sort of loaned him out to the War Department in exchange that he got access to the bombing run that dropped the bomb on uh, Nagasaki. So this was quid pro quo. He was expected to carry water for the War Department, and he actually was working with them to develop pamphlets, propaganda pamphlets, about this new weapon to make it seem less horrendous than it was. And he was also expected to deny that there was radiation poisoning as a result of it. So you could sell it to the American people as just a really big bomb and not something that makes people sick for years on end after the fact. It was an arrangement that worked for both parties. The party that lost was the American people who didn't know the truth about what this bomb really did until months later, where, again, you have a very narrow period where you can set public opinion with what comes out first. And people just say, okay, this is the story. There's no radiation poisoning as a result of the bomb. And uh, in fact, of course, there was. And other people were reporting it, including some of their own reporters, who they subsequently shut down in order to keep the propaganda line. Is this an example where the government actually told the papers what to write? 
they, they told them what to write and they willingly said, sure, th- let's make the deal. The, and the mm-hmm. deal was, you get your reporter to be with the armada that's dropping this bomb. You get to have the first story. You get to report from looking out the window as you're seeing the mushroom cloud rise into the air. And we get the New York Times to help us write the propaganda and to publish it in their paper. It's unbelievable because, as I say, we keep thinking that before we were born, these news entities were reliable. But, you know, these are obviously examples of things that have happened many, many years ago. It's just the public was unaware that we were being manipulated, I guess. Yeah, we we place a lot of store in the brands that have been built up for decades, if not centuries. And, you know, the Times, I think, is actually it, it is different in a way. I mean, I did a lot of comparison with the book, looking at what the Washington Post did, for example, when the New York Times was calling the Berlin Olympics in 1936, the Nazi Olympics, the greatest sporting event of all time. The Washington Post was actually saying, this is a disaster. This is a propaganda win for the Nazis. So the Times is different in that way, but it's also symbolic of the rest of the media, which is why it's it's such a fascinating way to look at the media through this lens. It, it, that is a, an interesting question, I guess, that you asked yourself, and I should have asked you too, which is, how did the other media outlets report on all these issues? But you're saying that really the New York Times had its own agenda. Yeah, in most of these cases, that was the case. I mean, the Post was pretty good on the uh, the Nazi stuff. They were not reporting like the Times was. Mm-hmm. Um, on the atomic bomb uh, the radiation new poisoning, there were plenty of other reporters who were on the ground saying there's absolutely radiation poisoning going on here. Um, the same would be with the Holocaust, of course, mm. lots of reporting by other papers. People ask me, how does it get this reputation for being number one if all this is going on? My answer is that its reputation for being number one is because of all this stuff, because they were working with the Nazis to get the best scoops, because they were working with the War Department to get their reporter on the plane looking out the window at the mushroom cloud. Mm. They were willing to sacrifice everything, first of all, the truth, in order to stay number one. Mm. What about Iraq? That's another example that you bring up, I guess, somewhat more recent, something that some of us can still remember. Yeah, Iraq, I think it fits that pattern. They, They really came out looking for prizes. They had a new editor at the time named Howell Raines, who really wanted to make the New York Times, which was, you know, a very well-known, but still mostly focused on New York paper, into this national phenomenon in news, more like CBS or ABC than just a newspaper tied to a city. So he said, we're going to increase what he called the competitive metabolism of the New York Times. We are going to be number one. We're going to beat the Washington Post for Pulitzers. And we are going to do that by getting rid of all our kind of... uh, blue dem hangups and we're going to go after that the red meat uh, for the story and the red meat for this story was saddam hussein has wmds weapons of mass destruction that wasn't true of course but they were so invested in that narrative and they were so invested in securing the pulitzer which they won that they they blinded themselves mm. and uh judith miller of course played a role in that where she was reporting stuff that it didn't it didn't make the cut it didn't meet their own standards for you know when you've got the story of the decade and your source is a guy standing 100 feet away from you wearing a baseball cap saying this is where the weapons were pointing at the ground and you can't interview him and you don't know his name and you don't know who he is but you run that story anyway you know there's a problem and it's not just about judy miller it's about the paper that was allowing that kind of reporting to hit its front pages i mean a lot of it comes from leadership but certainly they ended up throwing judith miller under the bus yeah they made this huge hue and cry about protecting their reporters and protecting the sources this was after she reported on the identity of a of a cia agent that was leaked by someone in the administration she went to jail for that she stood behind her principles and her convictions and she actually sat in jail and the New York Times, uh, the Salzburger, uh, that Salzburg at the time, and there's a different Salzburger now. There's always he, a Salzburger. There's always a Salzburger, and his name is always Arthur. And so that Arthur Salzburger, he came out and went on uh, Charlie Rose saying, we stand behind Judy and what she's doing, and it's terrible conditions. Meanwhile, she's saying the conditions are actually okay. But she gets out of jail, and then two, three days later, or maybe a week later, they fire her. And that was that, because it was no longer good for the brand. 
You know, what I remember hearing about the stories from Iraq were all these um, veterans that were suffering from PTSD yeah. and just coming back to America and beating their wives and killing people. Yeah. I, I just, the way veterans were treated, I mm -hmm. to me, this was the first time that we started seeing Americans really bash veterans in a yes. way that was really disruptive uh, to our psyche. Yeah. The next chapter after WMD in my book is that the Times came out with this uh, homicidal veterans narrative. And it was really being advanced by a young reporter named Jason Blair, who was a rising star at the paper, very young. He'd had a few red flags associated with him for, for a lot of errors that kind of didn't make a lot of sense. But he was bringing home the goods. And the goods in this case were that these veterans were coming home broken and crazed and whatever, whatever that violent, fit so that narrative. Yeah, violent. Right? Yeah. Turns out he was making up most of those stories. He was fabricating them out of thin air. And if you kind of looked at his How do you know that? How do you know he was making it up? Was is it already Oh, that was exposed. It's yeah. exposed already. Yeah, yeah. He was fired. He was if you if you just looked at the timeline of his reporting, it was physically impossible, physically, for him to have been in the places he said to have been interviewing these sources. And when the Times actually went and re-interviewed them, they said, I never talked to this guy. I don't know who he is. Um, but what he was saying using these people who had some of them lost loved ones in the war was that this the son or the daughter, whoever it was, was broken, was regretful, remorseful, what ha or, or angry about it. And he, they would go and interview these people. And the actual person, if the person was still alive, would say, no, I'm proud of my service. It was hard. I don't regret it. I Maybe it was an amputee or maybe they were injured, but they say, I feel okay about what happened. But the, the homicidal veterans thing was just a lie. <laughs> they, they just made it up. There was no statistics to support it. In fact, if you looked at the actual numbers, veterans coming back from Iraq were less likely to commit acts of violence than the general population. Wow. So why, why did they push this narrative that these veterans came back violent? Because they had just supported the Bush administration with the WMD stuff. And when their readership looked at them, be like, what happened? You just supported the most evil guy on earth, which is how the media made Bush, Bush look at the time. Right. Uh, they had to atone for that. And they did it by now saying this was the most evil war that had ever shift the narrative yeah. shift the narrative where they would look like back to the base yeah yeah it sounded from some of your interviews and your writings that you got into this business of exposing the gray lady or the new york times through something that is very similar to my personal experience which is the reporting on israel yeah um and so tell me a little bit about that how did you get to um realize that even the New York Times owned by Jews is lying about Israel. I got to Israel, you know, it was like the very tail end of the Intifada. There were still bombings here and there, but it wasn't like it was in 2000, 2001. And you just read what the Times says about the country and not even the, the, the war that the Intifada was, but just what daily life is like mm -hmm. between Jews and Arabs. But that's what really struck me, and it still strikes me today after I lived there for 20 years now. It is more or less a place where coexistence is real. It's part of our daily lives. And it is not this ongoing enmity between Jews and Arabs. And there's not this ongoing persecution of Arabs by Jews. That's just not what life is like there. And you can feel that. And when you read the reporting, you, and the New York Times is putting dead children, dead Palestinian children on the front page, photos of them in a montage. And they've not done that for any other war in the history of the New York Times newspaper. You think that something is going on here. Mm -hmm. And then you look at their reporting on the Holocaust, on World War II, on any other number of things, and you think, okay, well, I think I understand what's going on here. Um, that was part of it. So do you think the same reason that they did not produce any articles about the Holocaust uh, or any significant articles about the murders of Jews in the Holocaust is a similar reason why they were so focused on bashing Israel and lying about Israel. Yeah. It's the same kind of ideology. Yes, of definitely. Just distancing themselves and not looking mm -hmm. like they're part of, you know, the Jewish group or something like that. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like reverse anti-Semitism, or it's it's actually anti-Semitism yeah. done by Jews. Yeah, because, it, for again, for them, they don't see 
Jews as a people or as a nation or even as an ethnicity. So why should they have a state, mm-hmm. right? You got America. It's fine. Mm-hmm. But th- so f- they've been anti-Israel in that way, politically anti-Israel for you know since Israel's birth. And um, this was just a way for that for them to drive home that message. And it it sort of optimizes over time. It gets more and more intense as the ideology kind of compounds within the newspaper. Because again, this is a dynasty. It's the the hand down, not just control and ownership, but ideological commitments. Hmm. And you get to the point where it's both ideological and from a business perspective, benefits them to pander to that base that Hmm. feels the same way. You know, I, I mentioned that a similar story happened to me where I'm an American, I was born here in the United States, and I lived in Israel for several years. And when I came back from Israel, and I saw the lies about Israel, there were two things that really got me into the business of trying to share truth with with the public. And one of them was education, the Mm -hmm. teachers' unions, and the lies that are being taught to American kids, uh, the lowering of standards, and all of that really ties into the great big American lie, and that is that the teachers unions actually care about kids or teachers. They don't care about anybody except for their own power and money. And the other great lie that woke me up was the lie about Israel, right? Where, you know, places like New York Times would report that Israel is an apartheid state. And I, I, I came back from Israel as an American. I'm like, wait a second. I live there. There is no apartheid state. I mean, in, in high school, we would have friends that spoke Arabic. It's why I can kind of get, a, get, get away with a few Arabic words. And so this great big lie that Israel is oppressing, you know, the, a minority Arab population um, and the fact that the New York Times is propagating that is, is just mind boggling. For me, the, if that's their point of view, that's okay. It, Everyone's entitled to it. The problem is that when you actually start to change facts, change the ground truth in order to support the narrative, and that's the 1619 Project is another great example of that. If that's your point of view in America, I don't agree with it. It's not how I think. That's all right. But when you're distorting and perverting the historical record to achieve it, that's actually a very different story. That's where things become really dangerous. And that's what happens with Israel. You know, the, uh, Mohammed al Dora was the young boy who was killed um, under unknown circumstances in the beginning of the Intifada. And the New York Times came out within days of that happening, saying Israel murdered a child. That was in uh, the Intifada, was it 2001? It was, this was in 2000. Things in broke 2000. out. Yeah. And, and I think his death was in 2000. The New York Times wasn't there. They didn't have what a reporter. What was the exact there. story? Remind me. I should remember. The, the but... story was that he, the Intifada breaks out and under a very kind of weird set of circumstances, his, this is like mass violence in, in the territories. His father wants to go out and buy a used car or something. So that day decides they get stuck at a checkpoint where there's a gun battle between Palestinian terror factions and, um, an IDF post and there, this video emerges of this little boy with his father sheltering behind a concrete barrier, and the boy seems to be hit by a bullet and dies, or is said to have died. I mean, people people question that. I don't know. But the narrative that came out of that is that the IDF killed the boy. And the New York Times reported that, and not just reported it, they hit that, they hammered it home in op-eds, in mentions and other articles, and became gospel. Years later, there was a court in France that had to do with libel because a French Jew in in France accused a French news channel of sort of manufacturing this as a hoax. The French company sued him and the French court ruled in the favor of the Jew who who said this was not true. The forensic expert in France said there was no possible way, given the positions of the IDF and the child, that the IDF could have killed the boy. It was not physically possible. And the New York Times, of course, didn't respond to that, didn't report that after they had manufactured this myth about a, essentially a blood libel, that in cold blood, they had shot this boy. Who shot the boy then? Did we ever find out no, who act- it was how never, he was killed? No, it was Why was there seen. a boy running around? None of it really makes uh, sense. Fire. It's not been resolved. Mm-hmm. But um, what is clear is that it was not Israeli soldiers. And what is clear on the media side is that 
Israel was blamed for that for that occurrence. Did the New York Times ever publish a correction no. or an apology? Never. No. And that that was the myth that in part was used to justify the murder of Daniel Pearl, the Wall Street Journal report, reporter who was killed by Al Qaeda. They said, "Look what you are doing to our children. Your own media is documenting this, and we are taking our revenge." Do you happen to know how the New York Times reported on Daniel Pearl? Uh, no, not not really. I would imagine, you know, um, lukewarm. I imagine. I, I never really looked into that. No. Yeah. So uh, on to a more recent issue, and that is critical race theory in the 1619 project, which yeah. I would hope is considered a massive failure. But what is scary about it is that they've been successful at not just being a news media company, but now an educational company, right? The 1619 mm -hmm. Project had the goal of actually being in schools and essentially yeah. brainwashing the American yeah. student public, right? And now it is. And now it is. Yeah. So what are the origins of uh, the 1619 Project? The 1619 Project came from uh, a reporter, New York Times reporter named Nicole Hannah-Jones who w had reported quite a lot on race, a lot about what she describes as segregation in the education system, that black kids go to school with mostly black kids and white kids go to school with mostly white kids. If that's true or not, I don't know, but that was her approach. So she came up with this idea, which was really born out of the critical race theory movement um, that had its roots in the 1970s in, in academia at Harvard and other places. And that was taking the argument to its absolute extreme, which is to say that America was not born in liberty, but born in slavery, mm -hmm. born out of slavery. And that was the 1619 number, which is the year that slaves arrived in the colonies. So it wasn't 1776 where America achieved or declared independence, but 1619, that is the true birth of the nation. And they made this into the biggest possible editorial initiative that they could make, which is a full issue of the New York Times magazine dedicated to that concept. And then sort of as you're kind of referencing, growing it out into this brand extension thing that includes educational curricula and colleges and podcasts and a show with Oprah and movies and children's books, you name it, they did it. And uh, in that regard, it's been very successful. And sort of as I'd mentioned earlier, it was, it was really a centerpiece of their marketing mix. There's really a way for them to appeal to a younger, more woke generation that they were re really eager to, to get hold of as new subscribers. So you think it was part of this whole woke industrial complex where yeah. they realized that if they push this narrative of critical race theory, is critical race theory part of the 1619 project? For is sure. That, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And can you explain critical race theory and how it's connected to what they're trying to teach through this project? Yeah, sure. It's it's really about um, taking the the fundamentals of critical theory, which was a philosophical movement from uh, the early 20th century, which said that truth is not an objective thing. Truth is whatever the the victims of power say it is. So who decides well, who are the victims of power? Well, we do, the people who are talking. And that really was a huge reorientation from this like classical enlightenment notion of truth, which is something that we all kind of do our best to approximate together and saying, no, this is about what I declare to be the truth, that truth is about power. It's <laughs> not about knowledge. And they took this and sort of applied it to race and said, if you look at this this racial hierarchy, a hierarchy of racial victimhood, that the people with the most truth are the most victimized. <laughs> and they sort of use that to manufacture the world we see today, which is that you've got the, you know, what people describe as the the race, the victimhood Olympics. Yeah, and yeah victim racial, bingo. I call it victim, victim bingo. bingo. Yeah. That's what 1619 is about. It's about saying, no, it's not about objective historical truth. Because when the project came out, you had historians, dozens of historians from prestigious universities, not right-wing people uh, coming out and saying, actually, this is not true. What you're saying is not true. Their own fact checker told them that you cannot say the Revolutionary War was fought to preserve slavery. That's not true. That was a professor of African-American studies, an African-American woman at Northwest University said, this is not true. But for them, with critical race theory behind them, it wasn't about what was objectively true or false. There was no such thing. It's about what serves the the needs of power and who deserves to have that power 
And for them, it was about this group of sort of radical people thinking about um, how, how to restructure power in America. And the New York so Times. So what did they do? That. They just ignored the historians yeah. that said it was wrong. It's just like, okay, never mind. We don't like what you have to say. Keep going with 1619. Yes. Yeah, they just ignored him. They just ignored their fact checker, um, a woman named Les- Leslie Harris, professor, who she, she came out in Politico and wrote an article about this saying they published the claim anyway. Mm-hmm. And that was the key, the key word anyway, mm-hmm. because it wasn't about historical truth and it wasn't about objectivity. And this was something that flipped in the Trump era. And they came out and started saying this in um, around 2018, 2019, where they said objectivity is no longer the goal of journalism. The goal of journalism was what they called moral clarity. Uh-huh. It was about taking a position, taking a, a activist approach to journalism and really pursuing that, that angle. I mean, the hypocrisy is so unbelievable because they were so obsessed with Donald Trump yeah. and claiming that he was lying and that they were all focused on the truth. Meanwhile, they've been lying to us for years. But not only have they been lying to us for years, they actually have an entire 1619 program that admittedly is not about the truth. How do they get away with that? How are they the paper of record? It's just bonkers. You know, and I think that's what comes back to the the whole through line of the book is that they they are willing to stay number one at all costs, including the cost of truth. And the 1619 Project is just a great example of that. Because you fire up all these people, you say something so extreme and so out there that it's going to be challenged across the board. It does make things a little bit more binary. We like it or we love it or we hate it, but that's okay for them. Mm-hmm. Division is okay for them. Division works great in media because you, you want that kind of energy, you want that kind of tension. And they achieved it with the 1619 Project. It's just so crazy. You know, the other hypocrisy is that they keep putting America through the purity test. Yeah. You know, oh, America was not founded by completely perfect individuals, and therefore America is this horrible place, right? That's the narrative right. that the 1619 Project pushes, but they don't apply that to their own background, right, in no. their own history. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, why has there never been a not non-white male publisher of the New York Times ever. I mean, they didn't even consider a, a, a different option. It's not even in the running. And I think that's what it is for them. It's like they can do what they need to do to support the dynasty. One thing that they've been really hardline about in the business of the New York Times company is being anti-union. They really try to crush the union movement within the paper. And that's been something that's come up recently where there's this tech guild that some of the tech staff and reporters are trying to form. And the New York Times is brutal when it comes to their own employees trying to unionize. When it comes to other companies and unions, they are gung-ho. So this is just another another facet of that. Are they starting to suffer from their own poison? It's not something I ever really thought would happen. But I think there's so much awareness today And I think there's so much focus on the New York Times from every angle about what's going wrong and what's happening there. The pressure of it and the cost of it, all the lawsuits um, that they're defending, it it has to actually take a toll on the business. Mm. And they recently had another shift in their their editorial leadership from Dean Baquet to Joseph Kahn, um, who I think is probably, you know, they had this recent uprising about trans issues at the paper where trans advocates and activists came out saying the New York Times is not covering this correctly. And rather than cave, they pushed back really hard. Rather than do the sort of town hall thing that they love to do, they said, absolutely not. And if you get up and walk out and protest, you're going to get fired. And that's a big shift for the Times. What are the chances that one of the Salzburgers will actually step down and give the winner of victim bingo their position? Zero. (laughs) Like yeah. one has to ask that, yeah. right? That's no, the wonder. Never going to happen. Are there, you know, I guess nefarious or outside influencers on these media companies, whether it's New York Times or CNN or, you know, all these folks that are pushing things that are so bad, they're so obviously bad for America that one has to wonder, where is this funding coming from? People ask me all the time, you know, is George Soros behind this? Or, you know, George Soros is known as like, 
the one big villain behind a lot of this kind of push for America to become more socialist. But mm -hmm. is it China? I mean, we know that, you know, there is a huge impact of, of China on the way America thinks now. Yeah. Have you done any research on that since publishing your book? Yeah, Soros, I don't know what the, the relationship with the Times, but China, for sure. I mean, China, the Times actually has a Chinese edition of the newspaper. It's it's one of the few uh, language editions dedicated to a single country. I think it's the only one, actually. And for them, it's the future. I mean, you've got 1.4 billion people, 1.6 or whatever billion people in that market. And accessing that market is for them... Massive. Yeah, it's massive. It's where the growth is. They they know that growth in the U.S. is going to be limited to what it, what it currently is. So... For them, it's all about getting access to the market, but they also know that they are bumping up against the Great Firewall, which means that if they say the wrong thing, which they did when they when they first launched their Chinese With the edition, CCP, yeah, they they did some reporting on very senior CCP figures and corruption, and they just got banned hmm. from China from that day on, and now they're trying to fight to get back in, and that means you can't go too far in what you report on China. You can't stray from the party line. Otherwise, you're not going to ever access that market, and your competitors will. And you can see that today, and it's an echo of the Holocaust coverage that they didn't do, which is the Uyghur coverage. There is a genocide taking place in China against an ethnic religious minority. And ask yourself, when was the last time you saw front page coverage about the Uyghurs in, in the New York Times or any other newspaper? They just don't do it. They don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything about it. And of course, the New York Times, like many other American news organizations, has until fairly recently taken money from Chinese propaganda, from China Daily, was paying out huge sums of money to, to advertise. And these advertisements were actually advertorials. They look like editorial. You'd open the New York Times print edition, you would see great coverage about China and CCP. And if you didn't happen to see the little editorial label at the top right of the paper, you wouldn't know that it was paid for by the Chinese Communist Party. So you think that the New York Times, just like they played friendly with the Nazis during the Holocaust, they're playing friendly with the CCP now? For sure. Just like any huge tech company would do and does, it's the same calculus. COVID. Yeah. Do you think that's related? you think the way the New York Times did not report about the Wuhan leak, in fact, pressured people and, and mocked people Yep. who spoke about the truth, about the uh, the leak of the mm -hmm. lab. Is that connected? Is that part of them wanting to play friendly with China? Probably. I, you know, I think when they came out on February 17, 2020, it was a month before a pandemic was declared, saying that if you think this came from a lab in China, that you're a conspiracy theorist, there was no scientific publication at that point saying anything like that. There was only one thing that said that, and that was an article an editorial in China Daily saying the very same thing using the same exact language one week prior. One week later, the New York Times comes out saying the same stuff about the lab leak being a racist conspiracy theory. And that was a line that they held for quite a long time. And it had nothing to do with Donald Trump. Donald Trump was praising China in February and March of 2020. He was saying she is doing a great job. And it was only in April that he came out talking about lab leak. The New York Times had been on this anti-lab leak crusade for by that point, two months. So they set the tone, absolutely. Why do you think the New York Times was on this anti-lab leak crusade? I think it was um, in part because they were paying attention to the China Chinese messaging. And I think the overwhelming influence with that was Anthony Fauci. Donald Mc McNeil was their top COVID reporter at the time. He was actually writing to Fauci saying, you're doing such a great job. That press conference you did was amazing. I got a bobblehead of you. <laughs> I actually bought two. To These are New York Times contributors that are yeah. you know, celebrating Fauci and giving him kudos? Absolutely. And it went both ways. And Fauci would write back saying, thanks, Donald, you're great too. And I love what you did in that article. It was amazing. And that was the relationship. And uh, that, that was because Fauci holds enormous amount of power. And if you're a science reporter, you're dependent on access to Fauci to do a really good job in that vertical. And they all knew it and they all loved him and they all looked at him as this god. And when he handed down the messaging about lab leak, they just ran with it. That's There's no other reliable explanation for why they would call lab leak a conspiracy theory in mid-February 2020. So, so it was because they wanted to make him happy so that he continues to give them access to information or it's no, just this whole like They've just cycle? believed what he said. 
And he says this came from an animal. This was animal spillover. And we're seeing a lot of conspiracy theory about people talking about the lab in Wuhan. And that's all it is. And that's the re- that's the story that they run. In your opinion, did Fauci know more about it? And he For sure. wanted to just not share that with the public? I mean, was he based? What, do you think that Dr. Fauci was lying to the New York Times and then the New York Times was sharing his lies because they believed what he said? He may not have known exactly what happened at that point. I'm sure he knows now. But he did know what kind of stuff they were doing in that lab. He funded it. Mm-hmm. And what what really set him off in this sort of panic in late January was discovering a science magazine article saying that one way that that COVID could have emerged is in this kind of study. And it referenced a 2015 study done in the Wuhan lab. And Fauci says to his deputy, go find out if we funded this study. They did fund that study. And the deputy came back and told him that. The next day, Fauci said, we need to do this emergency conference call with some of the top scientists in the field to kind of start coordinating the messaging. And that's exactly what happened. Why do you think he lied? Because this is the worst pandemic in a generation, many generations, and he might be culpable for wow. for starting it. The kind of research, you can call it research, I would say in air quotes, that they're doing is to take exactly like what, what kind of virus this is, bring it into a lab, and give it what they call pandemic potential. That's the research. Can you take a non-harmful virus, put it in a lab, and make it a pathogen of pandemic potential, PPP. That's exactly what they've been doing for for 10 plus years. And he is the primary funder of that research. Have you heard of NewsGuard? Yeah, I have. So NewsGuard has had uh, an impact on us in a really bad way. Dennis would speak about things related to the lockdowns, and COVID. We would receive these threatening emails from this organization called NewsGuard saying, you know, you are propagating misinformation and we're going to let the public know that, you know, basically you're fake news. First of all, I was like, what fake news? I mean, every person we bring on has, you know, credibility and it's legitimate sources. And unlike the New York Times, you know, we're not looking to play friendly with, you know, certain interest groups, but we would receive all this pressure from NewsGuard to not report on things. And at first we were like, well, who cares what you even have to say, NewsGuard? If you slap us with a bad label, you know, supposedly you think that what we're saying is not true, you know, we shouldn't have to worry about that. But because they have all of these connections with other entities, they essentially apply pressure on Mm -hmm. other organizations and companies not to work with PragerU. And so actually NewsGuard became an issue not when they sent us these threatening emails, but when they actually informed other companies not to work with PragerU. And so we received an email from JW Player, our video servicing company, telling us that we have a month or so to take off all our videos and find a new entity that's going to serve our videos. And you know, when we asked them why, their answer was, well, you know, NewsGuard gave you a bad rating and God forbid they would work with a company that gets a bad rating from NewsGuard. And I do foresee that this is what's going to happen with other entities and other, you know, businesses that won't work with companies that are simply afraid of the NewsGuard rating, right? They, they don't want to deal with it or they actually believe it. And that will ultimately lead to what I call economic suffocation, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to suffocate us from working with any other groups. Eventually, they're going to go also into financial institutions that shouldn't work with entities that propagate misinformation, according to NewsGuard. And um, I'm just curious what kind of experience you have with these, you know, entities that guard the news. Uh, clearly, there is some stuff that is happening behind the scenes where they put pressure on companies, media companies to not share information that whether it's the government or big interest groups don't want to have shared. Yeah, NewsGuard, from from what I know, which is not that much, but what it seems to me is that they are they are sort of this seal of approval of what is correct information, right think, and what is wrong think. And if it comes out of this, you know, let's say twenty to thirty news organizations that are approved by them, then it's automatically good and uh, okay for consum- consumption. But I think the actual danger is on the other side, where they're just rubber stamping, they're giving a seal of approval to information that may not be reliable at all. 
So if you're the New York Times, the Washington Post, the notion that you're now just, you've got this glaze of credibility, of, of trustworthiness, but we all know that that's actually not true. And the American public knows that's not true. When you look at the trust in media numbers, it is a steep decline. And I think what this is, is a way to push back on that. It's a way to sort of create this ring of enforcement that just said, we're going to ram this through. We're going to make sure our guys get the right kind of treatment and service and the other guys don't get it. It's not even about red and blue anymore. Right. It's about, are you aligned or are you not aligned? Right. I completely agree. I, you talk about the New York Times as a dynasty. I think of NewsGuard as the guardians of this yeah. dynasty, right? They're guarding. Praetorian uh, Guard. And, right? Yeah. That's exactly what they are. Yeah. Of course, New York Times gets a 100% rating. And you have a book full of information about how not only do they keep getting it wrong, but they never apologize or print a correction. You know, you have the New York Times with 100% rating and 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 Prager U receiving this, you know, red label warning everybody that we're the ones who are telling lies. And I completely agree. It's not a left versus right. It really is about who they can control and which narrative they can control and whose narrative they cannot control. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's sort of also what we're seeing um, with the current banking crisis you know, if you don't get in line and say, oh, the, the, the financial system is okay and the banks are completely solvent, then you are cast out as some sort of lunatic or out, outlier, even though it's clearly the case that something is very wrong mm -hmm. with America's financial system. But you can't say that out loud because if you say it out loud, you threaten to rock the boat. We can all see with our eyes what's happening, mm -hmm. but you can't say that out loud. It's like 1984. Yeah, exactly. Can I ask you the hardest question? Sure. Where can someone get honest news? What would you do? I mean, where can we actually go for trustworthy news? I think it's, it's really about rethinking the way we interact with the news. And just like we, we rethought the way we interact with music, where it was no longer about the album. We used to go out and buy an album mm -hmm. and then you would say, Oh, this is going to be a great album. And we used to do the same thing with the newspaper. I'm going to go out and buy the newspaper and be like, everything in here is going to be more or less good enough. Uh, we, we can no longer do that. And now we have Spotify and I say, I'll, I'll, I want this song and that song and make a playlist. And it's the same thing with news. Say, all right, this report at the New York Times is really good. And this one at Fox News or Washington Post or wherever you might find it is good. It's no longer uh, enough to just trust the brand, hmm. which is what we used to do. We used to use that as a kind of heuristic to say, this is good. You can't do that anymore. You have to say, I trust myself. I trust people around me who I know. And I'm going to do my own research to understand what I can rely upon and cherry pick. It's so interesting because I actually think this is happening from both direct directions, right? A lot of newsmakers are realizing that they don't want to be part of a larger entity where they can, you know, Barry Weiss left the New York Times. Who knows what's going to happen with Tucker? Yeah. Uh, but you have like Tim Pool and all these other folks that are actually coming out of these media establishments and very likely are going to build their own audience base that's going to follow them directly. And, and you were self-published, right? Yeah. And so I guess you're another example of how being part of these established entities is actually coming across now less trustworthy. Yeah. And also, the economics are better. I get to re retain all my rights. I, when you sell a book to a publisher, you give away your rights in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Universal rights around the world forever. If you don't want to do that, you can now do something different. It's the same with news where Barry or uh, Andrew Sullivan or Glenn Greenwald, um, they are the masters of their own fate editorially. Mm -hmm. And to your point about Tucker, I, I saw a clip, I think Dave Rubin posted of him and Dave talking. Dave said, are you jealous of Dave being independent? And Tucker said, of course I am, because that's the most important thing. So I think the move towards independence, wherever you are politically, it doesn't matter. It's about being independent. It's not about being enchained to some huge organization. Today, 90% of the media is in the hands of six companies. And those companies are gigantic companies. That's Comcast. That's AT&T, Verizon, NBC Universal. These are giant companies that have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders, not to their news audience. Not to the truth. Not, and least of all to the truth. Mm -hmm. So they're doing what's good for the stock price or what's doing, what's good for their ideological commitments. And I think the truth comes last. Yeah. It's no surprise that they hire folks like NewsGuard and other fact checkers, uh, to try to take any sort of incoming competition down. 
It's a very clever model, the news card model. Yeah. Um, it's one I deeply disagree with. I think yeah. this, is, this is not what we need right now. What we need to understand is how reliable is the reporting? Hmm. That is the question we're all seeking to understand. NewsGuard doesn't answer that. NewsGuard deflects that. Right. And that's why it serves such a great purpose, a great uh, need for the media, because that's what they're looking to do is deflect. Well, I really, really enjoyed reading your book. Uh, you so it much. took me the whole weekend, uh, but it was totally <laughs> worth it. And I, I actually really highly recommend it because, you know, there are a lot of claims we made here in this conversation and the book actually backs it up with a uh, lot of evidence. And so I, it was a fascinating read. I hope thanks people so will much. go ahead and, uh, and buy it and get more informed. And thanks for all you're doing. And thanks for being so courageous to speak out. And um, I look forward to speaking with you again. Yeah, me too. Thank you. It's been great. As an historian, I'm often asked if I could stop one event in modern history from happening, what would it be? My answer is World War I. If there had been no World War I, there would have been no Russian Revolution, no World War II, no Holocaust, no Cold War. And that doesn't even consider the millions who died in the war itself. Following the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, Europe experienced an unprecedented period of economic growth. Brought about by the Industrial Revolution, this new prosperity spawned rapid developments in science, medicine, art and political philosophy. The future of civilization never looked brighter. And then suddenly, it all went up in flames. The fuse was lit in June 1914 in a street in Sarajevo, Bosnia. It was there that Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. It should have been no more than a sad footnote in history. Instead, it changed history. Austria-Hungary, seeking to avenge the Archduke's murder, declared war on Serbia. But before taking this drastic step, it asked for and received a blessing from its powerful ally, Germany. Serbia, knowing that it had no chance against Austria-Hungary, called on its ally, Russia, to defend it. Russia agreed. To strengthen its hand, Russia solicited French support should war break out. France, ever suspicious of German intentions, assented. Germany then made a preemptive move to take France out of the war. The German command, having long planned this war, invaded France through neutral Belgium. This prompted Britain to join France against Germany. Suddenly, the entire continent was engulfed in war. The key player was Germany. Their strategy was to punch through Belgium and France and capture Paris before the French had time to react. This was the so-called Schlieffen Plan, named after the German general who conceived it. With France conquered, they would turn their attention to Russia. That Germany thought it would actually work comes down to one man, Germany's leader, Kaiser Wilhelm II. The Emperor of Germany from 1888 until his forced abdication in 1918, Wilhelm was a profoundly unpleasant, unstable and vicious personality. By 1914, he believed that Germany should not only dominate Europe, but the entire world. Had the Schlieffen Plan worked, Germany most certainly would have. But it didn't work. The British and the French put up stiff resistance in the West. Russia did the same in the East. The losses incurred by all sides were immediate and appalling. The widespread use, for the first time, of barbed wire, machine guns, tanks, and worst of all, poison gas, turns the fields of France and the steppes of Russia into vast cemeteries. By 1917, the war was at a stalemate. Who knows how long it would have stayed that way if the United States had not been drawn in. Ironically, President Woodrow Wilson had been elected largely because he promised to keep America out of Europe's war. His attitude changed when Germany attacked American merchant ships in the Atlantic. The final straw was the infamous Zimmermann telegram, in which Germany promised to give Mexico, in exchange for its military support, much of the American Southwest, including Texas. 
the infusion of American manpower and weaponry allowed the Allies to take the initiative. The war finally ended in November of 1918. 16 million people, soldiers and civilians, were dead. 3 million Russians, 2.5 million Germans, 1.7 million French, 1 million British, and 117,000 Americans. Russia was now in the hands of Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks. France and Britain were physically and morally shattered. Germany, forced into a humiliating surrender treaty at Versailles, would soon be further decimated by runaway inflation that destroyed what was left of its economy. Meanwhile, the United States retreated into isolationism. It was a pause not a peace. The stage was being set for a new and very much worse disaster, a Second World War, one that would lead to three times the deaths of the first one. It would be instigated by a madman who fought for the Kaiser and shared the same dream of world domination. Had it not been for World War I, we would never have heard of him. I'm Andrew Roberts for Prager University. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager with the Fireside Chat number. Number. The number is. She's cracking up, and I am looking at you trying to say what number it is. The source of all of my information did not know the number. Wow. Let me guess. 206. 207. 207. Not bad. Which, by the way, reminds me periodically to tell you that if you just pick random numbers, 36, 114, whatever it might be, you'll, you will find something very meaningful, both in my opening comments and in my answers to questions that people send in. These are often, or sometimes, they're about events happening at the moment, but even then, what I have to say is not just relevant to the moment. So have a good time and binge on fireside chats and send them to friends. It's very important that people get these ideas because they don't get these ideas elsewhere. Where are they going to hear what you hear on the fireside chat? I mean, think about it. This is, the, this is the whole dilemma, by the way, that people who share my values, we hear, we study under and we watch people and read people with different opinions. We can't help it even if we don't want to, we just do. We're inundated. But those who have opposite views do not watch us, do not read us, do not hear us. And that's, that is the dilemma in, in, in the Western world and in America specifically in a nutshell. We hear and read and study under them, and they don't hear or read or study under us. Big, big problem. Maybe insurmountable. That's why it's important to get these ideas out to other people. Let them react. Let them even differ. That's fine. I have no problem with that. I was uh, thinking about... Good and evil. I've been obsessed with good and evil all of my life since I was a child. I hate evil. I really do. People doing bad things to people who don't deserve it. It bothers me. It's always bothered me. So I have been preoccupied with that and with good, because good is pretty rare. I don't, I know, I haven't figured out which is rarer, great good or great evil. I think great good is rarer than great evil. It's not, a, not meant to depress you. It's just, that's what I think. Anyway, I was thinking about that, and I wrote my column on this subject. I was thinking about if a horrible regime took over America, and let's say it was a Hitlerian-type regime targeting Jews like Nazi Germany did. So I asked the question, who would hide a Jew? And it could be any group. It could be who would hide a landowner in communist China. They were targeted for murder. 
who, who or in fact, landowners in most communist countries were targeted for murder. Cambodia, uh, China, Soviet Union. So there are people during World War II who did hide a Jew, risking their lives when they did it, non-Jews who did that. And I have been preoccupied with them in particular because goodness, as I said, great goodness is rarer than great evil. So what type of person would risk their lives to hide someone they didn't know and who obviously was not a member of their group? religious, ethnic, national, whatever it might be. So there are not many books on this subject. There are thousands of books on the Nazis, and there are maybe a dozen or 20 books on those who who rescued Jews, which is ridiculous because we have to study good if we're going to make a better world. But we don't study good. And you know why? Because people think that good is normal and evil is the aberration a terribly naive belief. Good is often the aberration and evil is the norm. So it led me to remember something I wrote about about 25 years ago. About 25 years ago, I interviewed two professors, Sam and Pearl Oliner, O-L-I-N-E-R, at Cal State, California State University, at Humboldt. These people wrote a very widely, highly regarded book on altruism. Altruism is service to others, on basically goodness. And specifically, the book is about those who rescued Jews at the risk of their lives during World War II. They were particularly interested in it because they were both Jews. I think it's were, I, I, I'm, I, in, in the sense that I, I don't know if they're still with us. And I feel bad saying that because if they are, I feel terrible. But I, I, I haven't been in contact with them in decades. And they were older than I. Oh, hello, Snoopy. How you doing? By the way, oh, oh, before I continue with the Oliners, I got to mention uh, Otto. Mm-hmm. So Otto had surgery this past weekend. And you're not obligated to send a get well card because his reading skills are minimal. But I will tell you, somebody, unbeknownst to them, they did not know he was going to go for surgery, did a beautiful painting of Otto. But I don't know who you are to thank you. I wanted to send a thank you note. I have the name Siri in the bottom, S-E-R-I-E. But anyway, thank you very, very much. Beautiful, isn't it? Good job. Okay. So back to the Oliners. So these people, they themselves, these two professors, husband and wife, they had been rescued. They had been hidden by Polish Catholics uh, in Poland. They are secular. They are not religious. That's important because I asked them the following question. It's in my column on who would hide a Jew if Nazis took over America. So I asked Sam Oliner knowing all you know now about who rescued Jews during the Holocaust, if you had to return as a Jew to Poland and you could knock on the door of only one person in the hope that they would rescue you, would you knock on the door of a Polish lawyer, a Polish doctor, a Polish artist, or a Polish priest? Remember, these are two irreligious people, the Oliners. Without hesitation, he responded, a Polish priest. And his wife immediately added, I would prefer a Polish nun. Now, that's a very interesting thing. Two secular scholars, if they could knock on the door of anyone, a professor, a lawyer, a doctor, an artist, or a clergyman, in this case, Catholic priest, whose door would they knock on? It's a very interesting question for you to think about. Whose door would you knock on? I would knock, I would do the same thing. I would have knocked uh, on, on a Polish priest's door. In America, I would, I would knock on an evangelical. Poland's a Polish country, so I'll use America's Protestant country. I would knock on the door of a 
evangelical clergyman before I would a, uh, a, a professor of sociology at Harvard. Ask, ask any of your Jewish friends, whose door would you knock on? And give them the list. And include an evangelical uh, minister. See what their answer is. Secular professor, secular doctor, secular artist, or evangelical, even, even, even evangelical Christian Laban doesn't have to be a, a clergyman. Ask them whose, whose door they would knock on if they needed to uh, be rescued and they could only knock on one door. This is one of my many, many arguments that the, the West is, is dying, America's f faster than most, along with Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Dying, really, as a civilization as we know it. Its freedoms are dying. And it is all because of the death of Judeo-Christian religions in this country. Many of you who went to college, you were taught that religion is nonsense. God is, is nonsense. But you were taught this by very foolish and naive people. I asked many of the atheists that I have debated. Imagine you were driving a car in a city that you knew nothing about. In other words, you were visiting a city, you had a rental car, let's say, you were driving it at midnight, car broke down, uh, and all of a sudden you saw 10 men walking toward you. Would you or would you not be relieved to know that they had just attended a Bible class? Okay? People who tell you religion doesn't matter are lying to you because they lied to themselves. Answer that question. Would you or would you not be relieved to know they had just attended a Bible class? Every single person in this country would be relieved. If they deny it, they're lying. And it's very rare that I accuse people of outright lying. Of course they would. By the way, uh, another name that eludes me. Names is my, my, uh, my, my Achilles heel. Another great, he, he has passed away, he died of cancer. He was another uh, very major uh, atheist. Christopher Hitchens, that's who it was. Very prominent writer. He debated me on my radio show. We, uh, we did it publicly. And he wrote in his autobiography, he was apparently quite moved by my question because he developed the whole answer to it, but he changed my question in his autobiography. He changed it to prayer meeting from Bible study. I don't believe he did it intentionally to lie. He just, that's the way he remembered it. But I never have asked it as a prayer meeting. Prayer meeting could be any religion. Bible study has to be a religion based on the Bible. So e e either Jewish or Christian, or some, some variation on Christianity. So I specifically say Bible study, but he changed it to prayer meeting. And so he said, well, if I were a Jew and I were walking with 10 Muslim fundamentalists that had just been at, at, a, at a prayer meeting, I would be scared. But I didn't ask that. I said Bible study. I didn't say prayer meeting. Don't fool yourselves that uh, we're going to pay no price for the death of religion in America. Don't fool yourselves. We already are. We are losing freedom as we have never lost it in America. There is more censorship of ideas. There is more cancellation of people. There is more suppression of free speech than at any time in the history of the United States of America, including the Civil War. And it's no coincidence that America is more secular and fewer people go to church and fewer people are religious than ever before in American history. Whether you believe in God or not is of not great, no great interest to me. Whether you understand the consequences of the death of religion and God, that's entirely of consequence to me. And that's the major theme of my life. You better understand what happens when God dies, 
Humans follow shortly thereafter. And freedom goes first. Okie doke. Let's take question time. First, a video question. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Braylon, and I live in California, and I love auto so much, and I was curious what your favorite thing about auto is. Well, there are a few things I want to say about that. First of all, it cracks me up in a nice way that you love auto. <laughs> uh, I have a theory, but I'm not sure it's accurate. More women love their dog than men. Like, so I really have affection for Otto, but it's hard for me to say I love him. Whereas my wife will frequently get on the floor, give him a kiss and tell him that she loves him. Now, can you imagine me doing that? Or Nathan? Nathan is shaking his head vociferously, ladies and gentlemen. Now, same with Snoopy. I, I, I really, I ha I, I'm not joking. I really enjoy them. I like them. I have affection. It's hard for me to say I love them. Now, that's very controversial that you're saying. I know it's controversial, and, and, and it, I'm sure it bothers some of you, but it shouldn't. I treat them lovingly. That's, what, that's all that should matter. I'm just talking about feelings now, not behavior. I treat them very lovingly. As I point out, there are more dog beds in this house than human beds. But I can only say that I, I, I'm okay with it. I'm not the purchaser of them. <laughs> to be perfectly candid... Anyway, I know it's controversial, but it's so bizarre that we live in an age where that's controversial. What, there are no male-female differences? I, I get, you know, people have been so horribly affected by the nonsense of, of, of the educational system. I think that's one of them. I know that there are men who love their dog. I, I, I recognize that. But it's, by the way, it's an interesting question. Do married men love their dogs as much as single men do. Just a, just a thought. You know, a guy's living alone and his only companion is his dog. I get it. I'd probably love my dog too in that case, but I love my wife. Anyway, I'm a human lover. So just, just for the record, it doesn't preclude loving animals, but I enjoy animals and I take care of them and I'm very adamant about treating them well. I have not eaten veal all of my life because I learned how veal are raised and and uh, made and I and I and I will not eat them. So I am very uh, concerned about animals, but anyway, I'm only reacting to you Berlin that you who never met Otto other than through the fireside chat say you love Otto. Which is very sweet my my wife had completely understand. What is my favorite thing about Otto, you're asking? He is so easygoing. That's my favorite thing. Otto's motto is, what? Me worry? There's a famous old thing from Mad Magazine, Alfred E. Newman. Look it up. It's fun. You know it, Nathan? You know Mad Magazine and Alfred E. Newman? Yeah. I'm very touched. I didn't miss an issue of Mad Magazine in high school. It's cracked me up. Anyway, uh, that's my favorite thing about Otto, is how easygoing he is. Snoopy, on the other hand, is not easygoing. Snoopy is a basset hound and is therefore somewhat neurotic, which is fine. It's very lovable and equally lovable. Just they have different lovabilities. Okanoke. Rohin, 15 years old, Irving, Texas. How do we overcome temporary desires and pursue what we truly want? How do we stay balanced and not too encapsulated with social media politics? Those are two entirely separate questions. First, how do you overcome temporary desires and pursue what you truly want? First, you have to figure out what it is you truly want. A lot of people don't realize it. And they do let temporary things get in their way. You know, you, you truly want to be healthy, you should work out. Now, I may not look like I work out, but believe it or not, I do pretty avidly. 
And I, uh, it's part of the reason that plus I admit luck, I'm very, very healthy and filled with the same energy I had in my 20s. But I, I know what I want and I pursue that, trying not to let what I want temporarily get in the way. So you, you're already there because you have made a distinction between what you want temporarily and what you want in the, in the long run. So that's, that's, a big, that's a big deal, that you know the difference between the two. It's like I write in my book on happiness. Are we having trouble with Snoopy? He won't leave the room. Snoopy, so th- why don't you take a rest? We have three beds for you here. Is Snoopy making an appearance? No, he's right next to Nathan. Okay, be that as it may. How, how was Otto? Was he getting up? A lot of action here on the dog's part, folks. This is both the, uh, the joy and the price paid from doing the fireside chat at home. <laughs> In a regular studio, <laughs> we would not have this issue. I fully acknowledge So I write in my book on happiness, the difference between fun and happiness. It's uh, it's worth your reading. It's changed a lot of lives, the book on happiness. It's called Happiness is a Serious Problem, and that's a big difference. Chad, 35, Ellensburg, Washington. Dennis, I've recently gotten into cigars. Let me tell you, probably the most relaxing endeavor I have found since being diagnosed with PTSD from the Marine Corps. Wow. I will not smoke marijuana or other drugs. God bless you. Thank you for sparking my interest in this area. What would be your most suggested cigar to try? Well, first of all, that's the beauty of cigars. They're uh, they're infinitely safer than cigarettes because they're not inhaled, where cigarettes are. That's, that's That's the key difference. And they're delicious and they're relaxing. When I have a cigar with either of my sons, and we, we, it's a great talk that we have, it's a great bonding experience. I go to cigar lounges all over the country, and inevitably people know who I am at the cigar lounge and you know, take a selfie with me. And if, and if no one knows who I am, it's just as good, because I love talking to strangers. But it, it's a terrific thing to, to try, and uh, I, I do recommend it. What I don't have a I don't have a cigar f- to recommend to you because I have no idea what you like. Basically, they're divided between mild, medium, and strong. I happen to love strong, therefore I love Nicaraguan generally. The darker the wrapper, the stronger the cigar. You should try it all. Half the fun is trying them out and seeing what you like. Sarah Twenty Anacordes, Washington. Hello, Dennis, Snoopy, and crew. You hear that crew? I'm a college student at a pretty liberal college. Liberal college is redundant. And I grew up in a liberal, by the way, it's not really. I wish they were liberal, they're leftist. Liberal's fine, leftist is damaging. Because of all the hate conservatives get, I became really good at censoring myself. Yep. That's right, you and tens of millions of others. However, I know that this is not the right response and I am trying to become braver. 20-year-old, good, to your credit. However, I discovered that self-censoring is so ingrained in me that it is really difficult for me to tell someone I don't know very well that I am a conservative. What advice do you have for me and people like myself? Thank you for everything you do. So here, here is my advice. The sooner you come out of the closet, the happier you will be in life, the better you will sleep at night. I know this from all the people who have followed this advice. But you must know that when you do come out of the closet as a conservative, you you will suffer. There is no question you will suffer. As uh, the young woman who sat in for me, Julie Hartman, Julie tells the story of how PragerU and, and I touched her life deeply, influenced her philosophically, morally, politically. And then she debated, would she come, would she, as it were, come out? And so she came on my radio show, which is about as big a stepping out of the closet as you can get. And she then told me later she had two weeks of hell. 
That's how she described it. Where she actually lost some friends. You went on Dennis Prager's show. Are you a conservative? What's happened to you? So she tells the story about losing friends and being just attacked on the internet, Facebook, etc. And then she said, after the two weeks of hell, I sort of went into heaven. Why? I asked. Well, first of all, so many good people came into my life that I, I never knew. That's a big reward. When you come out of the closet as a conservative, then people know who you are. So the people who hate you for being that will attack you. But a lot of people will love you for being that. And then you'll have genuine friends, people who not only like your personality, but like your values. So that's one huge advantage of coming out of the closet. Another one is, and she, she said it to me just recently, I sleep really well at night. When you have to hide who you are, you don't sleep well at night. You sleep, the more inner peace you have, the better you sleep at night. That's true of, about all of life, not just politics. So I strongly recommend that you do so, especially at your age. It's not like you already have a job and have to feed a family and are afraid of losing your job because you uh, voted the wrong way, let's say. Jackie, 35, Sun City, Arizona. Not a question, but please let Mr. Prager know his impact. I'll let him know. After watching Fireside Chats, listening to his podcasts, and reading his books, Mr. Prager convinced me to go back to church in April 2021. That is so beautiful for me to hear. By the way, I contend, I don't know if there is one Christian who has brought as many people back to church as I have. And I'm, and I'm a religious Jew. And I'm thrilled about it, by the way. As you, as you heard from the beginning, the death of Christianity is the death of our civilization. So I'm very, I'm very touched. Guy in, in Prague, Czech Republic, when I was there last month lectu- lecturing, came over to me after the talk. He was about 25 years old. And in front of his group, he said, I just want you to know, Ben Shapiro brought me to conservatism and you brought me to God. Did I tell the story? And it's worth it anyway. And and I and I said to him, Well, just let everybody know it was two Jews who did that. (laughs) And everybody cracked up. Uh, But that that's very is very touching. So my husband and I have been trying to have a baby for a few years, and as of today, we are 16 weeks pregnant. I'm so happy for you. The love and gratitude I have for him is indescribable. Thank you for bringing me back to God. Without you, I honestly do not think we would have gotten pregnant. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That may well be. You have to be somewhat relaxed and at peace. It's much easier to get pregnant that way. That's why you know how many women get pregnant? They try for years. Nothing happens. They adopt a child, and then, then a month later, she gets pregnant because she's, she's at peace. You have changed our lives for the better. God bless and thank you. That's all I want to do is change people's lives for the better. As corny as it sounds, that's who I am. We're at 30, I'll bet. Yeah, just under. Yes. So, okay, everybody. Don't forget, watch, uh, watch Fireside Chats, send them. This is a good example. Here's a good way to, you don't even have to say anything, just say, you know, folks, I'd like you to see this Fireside Chat. That's it. Just put that up on your Facebook page or this article or, or whatever it might be. But you're not, you're not going to have a happier life inside a closet. That I can promise. I'll see you next week. I'm Dennis Prager. That was Otto.